and craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. The weekend starts here. It's 8 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. With the major National Conservative Conference happening this week, has Rishi Sunak lost the Tories? With a company recruitment service censoring adjectives and the Tate Modern changing an artist's pronouns 60 years after her death, has the world gone mad? Also, was the COVID response the biggest cock-up in history? I'll be joined by a top US author who says lockdowns were an unforgivable mistake. I'll be taking your video calls in a special installment of Dial Dolan. Is Nigel Farage right that we have been let down by politicians over Brexit? And you'll love this story. As a new app logs domestic chores, are men still useless in the house? After nine, in my big opinion, it's been revealed Britain now has fewer billionaires. Why is this bad news for you and me? Well, because this war on wealth might win a cheap headline, but it's a race to the bottom and will hurt the poorest in society. In my take of 10, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and their wildly exaggerated claims of a car chase. These two are driving me around the bend. You won't want to miss my verdict after 10. Wear a seatbelt. Also, should obesity be renamed so people aren't offended? And why have the NHS decided there are now 18 genders? I'll be putting that to tonight's newsmaker, free speech champion, Toby Young. So much to get through. You will not want to miss that Harry and Meghan monologue at 10. But first, the headlines with Rory Smith. Cheers, Mark. The latest from the GB Newsroom. A man who conned victims out of more than £100 million has been jailed. TJ Fletcher founded the website iSpook, which allowed criminals to make phone calls to victims pretending they were from trusted companies. It was brought down last year in the UK's biggest fraud sting. The 35-year-old has been sentenced to 13 years and four months in prison. Detective Superintendent Helen Rance says he clearly didn't care about the harm he was causing. Before it was shut down, iSweep was constantly growing, with 700 new users registering every week, and it was earning £80,000 per week. Fletcher was leading an extravagant lifestyle, benefiting from the profits, having no care for the misery he was responsible for. The parents of a disabled teenager jailed for gross negligence manslaughter have had their sentences increased. Kayleigh Titford, who was morbidly obese and bedridden, died at her home in Newton in 2020 after suffering from an infection. Her mother, Sarah Lloyd-Jones, who admitted the charge, will now serve eight years instead of six. And her father, Alan, who pleaded not guilty, will serve ten years. 
The brother of TV star Philip Schofield has been jailed for 12 years for child sex offences. Timothy Schofield, who was a civilian police worker, committed 11 offences between 2016 and 2019. The boy, who was abused by the 54-year-old, was praised for his remarkable bravery in coming forward. Around 600 people have been evacuated from villages in western Spain which are being threatened by a wildfire. The blaze has already destroyed some 20,000 acres of land. That's near the border with Portugal, while officials believe it may have been started by arsonists. The US has announced new sanctions on Russia targeting future energy revenues and military supply chains. Well, it's part of a wave of fresh punishments over the war in Ukraine, which have been announced by G7 leaders at a meeting in Japan. Earlier, the UK said it would be banning imports of Russian diamonds, copper, aluminium and nickel. Well, Ukraine's president met the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman on the sidelines of the Arab League summit in Jeddah. Vladimir Zelensky has also held meetings with the leaders of Oman, Kuwait and the UAE. Gulf countries have tried to remain neutral on the war in Ukraine, but in a speech to the summit, President Zelensky called out those who have been turning a blind eye. Boris Johnson's wife, Carrie, is pregnant with the couple's third child. She announced on Instagram they're expecting a sibling for Wilf and Romy in just a few weeks' time. Carrie said she's been feeling pretty exhausted for much of the last eight months, but they are looking forward to welcoming the newest member of the family very soon. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, though, back to Mark. Welcome to Mark Dolan Tonight. With a major National Conservatism conference happening this week, has Rishi Sunak lost the Conservatives? Also, with a company recruitment service censoring adjectives and the Tate Gallery changing an artist's pronouns 60 years after her death, has the world gone mad? Also, was COVID and the response to it the biggest cock-up in history? I'll be joined by a top US author who says lockdowns were an unforgivable mistake. Plus, I'll be taking your video calls in a special instalment of Dial Dolan. I'll be asking you, my viewers and listeners, is Nigel Farage right that we've been let down by politicians over Brexit? And as a new app logs domestic chores, are men still useless in the House? No comment. In my big opinion, it's been revealed Britain now has fewer billionaires. Why is this bad news for you and me? Well, because this war on wealth might win a few cheap headlines, but it's a race to the bottom and will hurt the poorest in our society. We also got the NHS and why they've decided to have 18 genders. I'll be putting that to tonight's newsmaker, free speech champion, Toby Young. Plus, we've got a developing story. The creator of a freedom of speech uh, podcast, which is called Trigonometry, Constantine Kissin, has announced online that his company and his podcast has been defunded by their own bank. He'll join us after 10 to tell us why. Also, why do people murder? My Mark Meets guest is the forensic psychiatrist whose job it is to rehabilitate some of the worst monsters in our society. Can they be cured? In my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and their wildly exaggerated claims of a car chase. These two are driving me around the bend. My verdict on Harry and Meghan and their Thelma and Louise impersonation after 10. Now, Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages from 10.30. You can set your watch to it with full pundit reaction. That's right, three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Peter Edwards, Ingrid Tarrant and Albie Amancona. Tonight, we'll be asking the pundits, was the Queen's funeral worth £162 million? Will Keir Starmer sleepwalk us back into the EU? And why are British women turning to Danish sperm banks? Plus your emails, especially the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. This show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. Let's start with this.
Now, this week saw a three-day event called the National Conservatism Conference, run by a right-leaning US think tank, which has featured contributions from the likes of my excellent colleague Jacob Rees-Mogg, Michael Gove and Suella Braverman, with the Home Secretary seemingly striking out at her own government's immigration policy and the so-called culture wars in what some perceived as an early bid for the Tory leadership should Rishi Sunak lose the next election. Given the fact that this event enjoyed much support from Tory grassroots and at several high-profile media, academic and political figures, does it show how detached mainstream Tories have become from their own movement? Has Rishi Sunak lost the Conservatives? To debate this, I'm delighted to welcome political commentator and author of Cheers, Mr Churchill, Winston in Scotland. It's out now. It's winning rave reviews. It's author Andrew Little joins me now. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Mark. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, great to have you in the studio. Has Rishi Sunak lost the Conservatives? Well, I think it's interesting, isn't it? The, the conference you mentioned uh, and indeed the, the National Democratic, the Conservative Democratic mm. Organisation conference earlier. Um, these are MPs, senior people in the Conservative Party who um, they're not quite an open rebellion, uh, but they're certainly agitating. And I think, as you said in your intro, they're very much looking uh, to what may happen with the leadership um, after the 2024 general election. Well, I get countless emails to this programme from viewers and listeners saying that I'm a former Conservative voter, but I feel politically homeless. Uh, they're now quite invested in other alternatives, like Reform UK, led by Richard Tice. How does Rishi Sunak fix this? Because at the moment, his movement seems to be fragmenting somewhat. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. And I'm enough of a historian to know that um, there's one very true adage in politics, which is divided parties don't win elections. Mm. Um, and Rishi, I think, has had a huge problem in the fact that he hasn't really got any kind of mandate. Um, he hasn't got a mandate from the membership. Obviously, they, they voted against him indeed. Um, and also, with the local elections result, uh, results, he hasn't got a mandate from, from the people either. Mm. Um, and mandates is really where, I think, political power springs from. Um, so it's very, very difficult, I think, for him to then bring people together, bring the backbench of the party together, um, because, as you say, they're looking down the barrel at a possible defeat at the next general election, and, and who's going to replace him? Yes. Now, your brilliant book about Churchill profiles his great leadership, his great vision, his great intellect. Does Sunak have any of that? Is this guy being underestimated, potentially? Well, I think that, um, uh, a bit like Churchill, of course, Rishi did come to, to the prime, minister, prime ministerialship at a time of um, national crisis, mm -hmm. um, not quite as severe, obviously, as June 1940, but uh, nevertheless um, uh, a serious one. He's inherited a bit of a mess. He has inherited a bit of a mess, that's true. Um, I'm not sure he quite has the leadership skills to put it right, though, as Churchill did. Mm -hmm. um, I think his response to the poor local election results has been very weak. Um, I think he, he almost seems to be hiding from the public, um, from his own party. Um, and I, I don't think he has really, to be honest, the, the, the charisma um, and the kind of intellectual heft to, to, to pull the party through. He's something of a technocrat, isn't he? And, and, and he's all about delivery, but that may not be enough in a year's time when he goes to the country. Mm. I think that's quite right. And I think that what we've seen this week with, with the um, various conferences is the Conservative Party looking for a way to renew itself. And I think it's very revealing that Rishi Sunak isn't really involved in those discussions. Uh, what we have is, you know, attempts to find a new uh, purpose, I think, for the Conservative Party, while it's looking to conserve. The Conservative Party historically is very good at renewing itself and, and evolving. Um, that's why it's, the Tories have won lots of elections over the last 200 years. Um, and I think it's very interesting that Rishi isn't involved in those discussions and the party doesn't seem to he think that he has a future in them. Yes, I, I thought this sort of offspin of, 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 of a sort of Tory movement, this Conservative conference, which has been put on by a US Conservative think tank, I thought it was indulgent. And I thought the only clear winner was, was Keir Starmer. Don't you think the right need to consolidate? Otherwise, Labour will win power. I think that is true. As I said earlier, I think divided parties definitely do not win. I, I thought that conference earlier this week, I thought it was ill-disciplined and indulgent. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was, it certainly was um, ill-disciplined. Of course, to, to go back to the Churchill example, um, he was someone who wasn't afraid to speak up when he thought that the party was, was going in the wrong direction. Of course, very prominently in the 1930s, he was very critical of, mm. um, of, of the Conservative leadership um, in relation to appeasement. Um, so there, I think there is a space for that. But I agree, I think the timing... Uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the, of the discussion and possibly this attempt to sort of bring over a ready-to-wear version of American 
um, ideology uh, that perhaps doesn't quite fit with what the British people may want um, may not work and I think, as you say, may, may only benefit the Labour Party in the long run. Churchill's greatest admirer in contemporary politics is one Boris Johnson. Do you think there is a potential opening for Boris Johnson should things fall away for Rishi Sunak and should he lose the next election? Well, I thought it was interesting that the Conservative Democratic Organisation conference, to me, had a slight, um, almost a Jacobite feel to it of kind of people gathering to toast the king over the water, but it had that slightly wistful air of perhaps it's not really going to happen. Um, and I do think that, that Boris might be, rather than like Churchill, maybe more like... Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, in the sense he'll come back with a, a great aplomb, uh, but it won't, it won't amount to much. Um, I, I think, as you, as you said correctly in the, in the introduction, really people are looking to, after the general election, I don't think there's much appetite mm. in the Conservative Parliamentary Party, at least, uh, for another go at changing leader within... Do you, do you think the whole movement, do you think that Conservatives are just exhausted and out of ideas and need a break? Is that why they're allowing themselves... Uh, all of this infighting, because if they were serious about another five years of power, they would fall into line in the way that many of those Labour backbenchers stayed quiet for three terms of Tony Blair in order to win. I think that's a very good point. I think that uh, this clearly is happening because the party's been in power for a long time. I think it's slightly lost its way. Possibly it doesn't really know why it wants to stay in government. Um, we were talking before we came on air about the situation in Scotland where I live. Mm. I think the SNP is in a very similar position, been in power for a long time. Mm. They're now starting to split apart. Um, so I do think it's a symptom of uh, a party that perhaps has been in government too long uh, and is desperate for some kind of renewal, a, a sense of a new purpose um, uh, as to why it should, should be uh, elected again. Mm. And what's your verdict on Starmer? Do you think he's a shoe in for number 10? How do you anticipate the outcome of the next election? Gosh, uh, no, no, no say, easy questions here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think, we will quote you on it. <laughs> I think, um, I, I think Keir's been very fortunate in uh, the time that he's been leader, given uh, the issues that the Conservative Party have had. Uh, that being said, I think he has done a great deal to modernise the Labour Party, which should put them in a good position. Whether or not he'll be able to quite win a majority, I think, is still, in my mind, a little bit uncertain. But if I were a betting man, I'd say he'll probably be the next Prime Minister one way or the other. Yeah, and it comes back to what we talked about when you mentioned Churchill, and a lot of this is, is, is about charisma. And, and yes, Rishi Sunak is, is no Oscar Wilde. He's no Boris Johnson, to be fair. But he's probably a more compelling character than Keir Starmer. I just wonder whether, if our system is increasingly presidential, whether it's a face-off between Sunak and Starmer, perhaps just in terms of personalities, Sunak edges it? I think that's certainly possible, in, particularly in terms of his experience. I mean, they're both quite experienced people in terms of their life before politics, but mm. you might make a case that Rishi has a more uh, useful background, possibly, as a, as a leader of the country in difficult economic times. Um, I do think, as well, obviously, personalities uh, do matter, but often... Uh, record and um, uh, ability don't count that much. I mean, you only have to think of 1945 yeah. and, and Churchill's defeat there uh, to a much more, I suppose, um, boring, you might say, if you uh, uh, Clement Attlee's Labour Party. So, yeah. so I think you know, there's hope for Keir there. Will, will, we, will we ever have in our lifetimes a, a, another politician of the calibre of Winston Churchill? Is there anyone in the Commons that's even 1% as special as he was? Well, I think that Churchill was very fortunate. It, well, it was a, very much a product of his time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's worth remembering, of course, that he was his career was largely written off um, until uh, the kind of late 1930s. Um, and those circumstances allowed him to, to, to display the brilliant, brilliant characteristics that we all benefited from when he, when he kept us in the war in, in, in uh, 1940. Um, I don't think looking around the parliamentary party on either side today, uh, you see someone of, of that quality, no. Um, but I am hopeful for the future. I think that um, if we uh, keep investing in politicians, try and get new, different people into politics, uh, we can find the Churchills of the future. I think that's a great shout. And perhaps fewer career politicians, after all, look at the career that Churchill had before he entered the Commons. Uh, my thanks to Andrew. I'm going to plug his book in a second. But we've just been asking you, uh, before the show, on Twitter, has Rishi Sunak lost the Conservatives? The results are now in. And 85% say yes, while a meagre 15% say no, they are still on board. Uh, my thanks to, to the wonderful, remarkable and very, very articulate uh, Andrew, uh, the wonderful Andrew Little. And his book is out now. It is called Cheers, Mr Churchill, Winston in Scotland.
Brilliant stuff. Uh, lots more to come. And there's the book. It's out now. Groundbreaking, says the top historian Andrew Roberts. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk about Nigel Farage. This week, my brilliant colleague said that politicians have failed us on Brexit. I'll be asking my viewers and listeners, is that true? Also, are men still useless in the home? And on COVID, was it the biggest cock up in history? We'll speak to a top US author who says exactly that. But next up, we're going to do The World's Gone Mad. Strong and dynamic, too masculine, apparently. We'll discuss that next with Leo Kurz. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <laughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Now, it's a huge privilege to be on GB News. I'm delighted to say that the show goes from strength to strength. Thanks to you listening and, of course, watching, whether it's online or via your regular tellies. I get so many letters. I get so many emails. I sometimes get gifts and they don't get much better than this. Take a look at that, folks. Uncanny. That is almost photographically accurate, isn't it? Uh, this is by Stephen Smith, who is an artist. A very highly talented one, portrait and landscape artist. Stephen, thank you for that. You've done an amazing job, although I'm not nearly that handsome, let's be honest. Although Stephen put a bit more effort into this one, Mark. Look at that. I... For people uh, watching on radio, which is actually impossible because it's, it's not a visual medium, um, this is a picture that he's done with paints of me. Yours is just, what I is that? I cannot believe pencil? it. All I got was a bit of pencil. Yeah. He clearly ran out of... He likes materials. me more. 
gutted, devastated. Well, that was the voice of the wonderful Leo Kurz, who just joins me in a moment, because it's time now for an occasional new item on the show called The World's Gone Mad, in which we look at some of the most bonkers stories of the week. And helping me do that is the aforementioned Leo Kurz. Let's start with this one. And this is exclusive to Mark Dolan tonight. GB News employee has been sent leaked details of a large UK-based business who have banned certain words from their recruitment process in an example of woke overdrive. A company's recruitment service has advised its employees to get rid of the words strong and dynamic on the basis of macho, masculine and Western culture-centred attitudes. Shocking stuff. Your reaction, Leo, the world's gone mad. It's mental. And also, these people claim to be progressive, but they're saying you can't use words like strong and dynamic yeah. because they are male words. They're saying no, no woman has ever been strong or dynamic. That is the most regressive, sexist thing I've heard since, well, since about five minutes ago when I, when I listened to The Guardian. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it's so uh, counter what, what they're trying to do. Yes, indeed. And of course, it's all about bashing the West, isn't it? They couldn't resist mentioning that this is somehow kind of a Western hierarchical structure. I mean, yeah. they're desperate to write white supremacy, aren't they? I know. And I should imagine this job is in the West. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to be working with the Inuit or, uh, you know, harvesting the dolphins uh, in Japan. So th this is, this is uh, a job that's existing in the West, in Western culture. And what's wrong with that? Why have, uh, have we in the West got to talk down our culture uh, so much? I understand that, you know, national pride or, or pride in, uh, you know, Western liberal democracy and all of its mm. achievements uh, has become something that the, the chattering classes don't like to do. But why has it got to, to flip into this constant self-flagellation? And what's curious is that it has infected a lot of the public sector, and that might not surprise you, universities uh, and, of course, the civil service, etc. You know, yeah. we've had civil servants required to put their pronouns in emails and all the rest of it. Uh, but it's concerning now that this woke capture is happening within corporations whose job it is in principle, just to make money, but they've gone woke too. Yeah, I and mean, the trouble with corporations these days is they have to have, uh, they have to abide by ESG rules, so environmental, uh, social and, and governance rules, which means they've got to show that they're reducing their carbon footprint, uh, employing enough minorities and, and you know, obeying the, the right sort of thinking. Uh, so that, that spills over into, into ridiculous actions like this, where they're, they're trying to get some of those points. They're trying to, so they can turn around to, to BlackRock or whatever invest fund and say, look, look, we've done all this stuff. Look, our, our job application says, you know, uh, you can't use these words. So we're, we're being progressive. Uh, so that means that BlackRock will say, yes, you've, you've collected enough ESG points. Here's all this money. Here's this, this investment. Mm. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the reality is that companies should just focus on making money. As soon as they stray from that, as soon as they start trying to build a utopia, uh, they quickly, you know, pr pretty much all the evil that's been done in human history has been done in the pursuit of utopia. Uh, to right. And of course, part of it is optics and pretending to be a lovely, caring corporation. Yeah. Whereas often the opposite is the case. I mean, these are ruthless businesses that are there to make money. And this is just window dressing, isn't it? It's cosmetic. Yeah, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole point of uh, ESG is to make money, is to get the investment from, mm. from Vanguard or, or BlackRock or whatever big investment firm. And these, these companies control huge, a huge amount of the investment that goes into companies. So that's why, uh, that's why uh, Netflix, for example, all, all the programmes it makes are generally pretty rubbish yeah. because they're trying to tick so many boxes and make sure they've got you know, enough, uh, enough black people playing obviously white historical figures uh, to, to get those ESG points. Uh, well, let's move on now because uh, you mentioned Netflix being rubbish. Well, it looks like comedy is for the chop as well because the iconic Cambridge Footlights group have hired a sensitivity reading service to avoid causing offence. Now, let's have a look at the legacy of Cambridge Footlights. They've produced Monty Python, yep. uh, David Mitchell from Peep Show, you, you name it, Black really. Adder. The, uh, Black Adder. What did you say? Black Adder. Black Adder, and, of course, Stephen Fry and Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Mm. So, as a top comedian, your reaction to the idea that there are going to be people reading jokes to see if they're offensive? 
Yeah, I mean, the whole point of comedy is you, you kick back against the prevailing orthodoxy. You don't follow it. You know, and th this is trying to enforce, uh, trying to enforce rules in comedy. That there should be the most free thinking place. You know, the stage should be a sacred place where, where you can transgress against social norms. Uh, but, but they're trying to enforce these rules like they would in Iran. The, you know, the Ayatollahs want to enforce these theological ideas. So you get flogged if you don't abide by them or, you know, in Russia, you've got to make sure you don't criticize uh, Putin. And, and it's, it's, the, it's the same thing, uh, same thing here. You know, we've got these, these woke rules that are governing our culture and you can't, you can't push back against them. It's gonna completely stifle comedy. Even though they say, they say, oh no, this is just, a, it's just suggestions we're making. Mm. Man, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to feel free to, you know, say what you wanna say and mock who you wanna mock uh, if, if you've got those rules hanging over you, if you've got people watching with clipboards to see if you, you misspeak or misthink. And also, how can they say, you know, you're, you're, because they'll say, oh no, you're punching up or you're punching down. It's like, if, I, if you're the people with clipboards standing over me, telling me where I'm punching, obviously, you know, I'm, uh, the, when you say I'm punching down, I'm actually punching up. Yeah, I mean, the whole point of comedy is that it's naughty. Louis C.K., the comedian, said, comedy is saying things that you're not supposed to say out loud. That's yeah. what comedy is. It's provocative yeah. and it tests boundaries. That's not possible. Have you ever seen an example of funny woke comedy? <laughs> no, it tends not to be because it's just it's just repeating the. I mean, you see these these woke comedians. They come out on stage and they're like, "Oh yeah, so I'm bisexual and pangender. Deal with it, guys." And it's like. It's 2023. Everybody dealt with it in the 80s. Yeah. We're fine with it now. That's not shocking. You know what I mean? Tell me about your accomplishments. Don't tell me about your, your characteristics that, you, that you're just born with. Tell me about what you've well, done. Well, yeah, a lot your... of work comedy seems to be a political rant and the yeah. audience clap and cheer, but they don't laugh. It's clapter instead of laughter. And the, the funny thing is, the funny thing is laughter is an involuntary response. Clapping is something that you've, you've made a decision to do. Good. Well, I've had a, a rough case of clapter so recently, but I'm pleased to say that the cream worked. Uh, let's talk now about the Tate Gallery, who have altered the pronouns of an artist to they, them, 60 years after her death. Um, listen, this is a shocking story, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this was an artist who was female, who was a lesbian. Yeah. And she created great work and she wore men's clothes. Yeah. So the Tate Gallery have decided that she was trans, yeah. even though the poor woman's been dead for 60 years. Yeah, it's not coming from her. It's not her self-identifying. It's, uh, it's Tate identifying. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, people who are dead can't speak. So for them to, to postulate on, on what her gender was, they say, you know, next to next our pictures, they say, oh, she could have been non-binary. She could have been transgender. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe she wasn't any of that. Maybe she was, like a lot of lesbians, uh, somebody who liked to wear male clothing. And I think a lot of lesbians feel erased by, by this sort of uh, push to, to make everything transgender and also again it's, it's a it's a very regressive thing to do it's a very old-fashioned chauvinistic thing to do to say oh well this person wasn't dressing <coughs> according to to what we you know the mm. 50s uh, norms of what a woman would be dressing she wasn't wearing a flowery skirt so she must be a man because she was wearing a suit it's like no women can wear whatever they want yeah for sure and and it's just this idea that somehow a woman, I mean, that's how stereotypical the trans ideology is, that a woman is somehow in a short dress and giggling with, with you know... Like Dylan Mulvaney. Breasts popping out and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, Dylan yeah, Mulvaney's yeah. like, you know, the, the girlhood, she calls it, you know, oh, day 300 of girlhood. It's, so, it's such an outrageously <laughs> offensive, stereotypical caricature. I, I salute them, to be honest. They're, uh, uh, they're, well, they're, mocking, they're mocking everybody. Too right, and, and it's very annoying for any of my viewers and listeners, our viewers and listeners who are lesbian, that they've had another icon taken off them, yeah. basically. Um, and and, and, and they've, done it, they've done it in other circumstances, the, the woke mob, uh, decided Joan of Arc was, uh, was somehow non-binary because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't abiding by traditional feminine norms and just sitting inside doing the washing up. It's, it's so, honestly, these people are doing the work of old-fashioned male chauvinists too and right, they're calling themselves right. progressive. And that was supposed to be your job. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Leo, I'm very excited because you're hosting Headliners tonight. Yep, I am. It's going to be a great show. Uh, so, yeah, lots of, lots of fun stories. We've got three comedians going through tomorrow's news headlines. Can't wait for it. Headliners at 11, as always. My thanks to the brilliant Leo Kirst. Coming up in Dial Dolan when I take your video calls, is Nigel Farage right that politicians have failed us on Brexit? And also, are men still useless in the home? But next... 
Were lockdowns the biggest cock up in history? We'll speak to a top author who says yes. That's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. Now, was COVID-19 and the response to it the biggest cock-up in history? Did we really need all of that economic damage? Did we need the lockdowns? Did we need the mask mandates? Ian Miller is the author of Illusion of Control, COVID-19 and the Collapse of Expertise. And he joins me now. Hi, Ian. Hey, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, your last book was about those mask mandates, which through data you demonstrate were pretty useless. Why did you decide to create this latest volume in relation to the pandemic response? Right. Well, I, it was to, the idea was to kind of cover the second half of the pandemic as these policies kind of expanded. And, and we saw the messaging shift where initially they were saying, you know, just wear every, anything to cover your face. So just roll up a T-shirt and put it in front of your face and that'll, that'll stop the virus. Uh, but then that messaging shifted where it said, oh, actually, you need to wear, you know, a higher quality mask, an N95 mask, things like that, or use, you know, vaccine passports to control the virus. So the goal is to show with a lot of the same data, you know, they were wrong about that stuff, too. So even though they're wrong at the beginning, they, they, and they didn't learn from their mistakes. They just kept trying more and more things that didn't work over time. Um, so it's kind of the, the goal is to show that as well. And it was kind of a comprehensive failure, as you mentioned. Uh, indeed so. I mean, were there any aspects to the pandemic response that did work, Ian? Because your book, which is a great read, is quite damning. 
I don't really think so. I don't think we did anything right. Uh, yeah, I think outside of a few isolated areas, obviously Sweden, you know, had as much of a light touch as they possibly could. And what they did made some sense, but it was following established pandemic protocol. And that's kind of what I bring up in the book and as well as the first book is, you know, we had plans in the UK, they had a, a plan to deal with pandemics, with respiratory virus pandemics, and they specifically omit masks. They never mention it, or it says, you know, masks are ineffective against aerosol transmission of respiratory viruses. Um, and then they threw all that out when COVID happened. They just kind of panicked and tried and threw anything at the wall to see if it would stick. So, uh, you know, I don't think that what we did was very effective. And, and I mean, not only was it effective, but it caused immense harm. And that's something that, you know, we're just now starting to deal with and ramifications of it. Well, that's right. Ian, I don't know what's happening in America, but here in the UK, we're experiencing very high excess deaths every week, up there with the worst moments in the pandemic, which would demonstrate to me that this desire to preserve human health has summarily failed. You would expect after all these measures uh, for excess deaths to be below average, not above them after a pandemic. Exactly. Uh, it, it's totally inexplicable. And but, I mean, it, to be fair, some of it was predictable. You know, there, the people were warning during the harsh lockdowns, during the mask, uh, during all these kind of restrictive discriminatory measures that this could be the case, that there were going to be knock-on consequences of lockdowns and school closures and, and mass mandates to, to general population health and, and also the trust and in, in expertise and trust in public health authorities. Obviously, I know you've been dealing with a lot of, you know, the NHS wait times skyrocketed throughout the pandemic. And, you know, that has consequences. People miss cancer screenings. They miss general health checkups. Uh, in large part because people were too scared to go to the hospitals or the hospitals were, you know, short staffed or whatever it would be. Well, in the U.S. here, we fired a lot of healthcare workers because they didn't want to get vaccinated. So then you have staffing shortages to go along with all these these longer term consequences. So it, it really was a comprehensive failure and, and a lack of foresight to, to see this coming. However, Ian, the authorities in this country, scientific experts around the world, the majority of whom would argue that mask mandates, the lockdowns and indeed vaccine mandates saved thousands of lives and prevented hospitals from becoming overwhelmed. They would argue that if we hadn't had these measures, many more people would have died. Your response? Right. Well, I think there's, there's a great data driven case to show that that's not the case. And that's what I bring up in the book, uh, you know, in the first book as well, is to show, you know, we can make comparisons of areas that are similar or, you know, it's just Sweden is a good example. But here in the U.S., we have a lot of different comparisons of areas that tried vaccine mandates or tried vaccine passports and mass mandates compared to neighboring areas that didn't. And you can see that there's absolutely no difference. Uh, one quick example is just in New York City, where they had very strict rules. They had this key to New York where they had a, a whole list of activities you were banned from doing if you didn't have their, their vaccine passport, compared to neighboring counties in New Jersey and the other parts of New York City, uh, New York State area. And there's absolutely no difference. And New York City actually has a higher case rate. And there's a lot of explanations for why that could be. But there's, there's no, you know, the, the, these are had the same numbers even before they tried these policies. So it's not like there's a, a big demographic difference there. So well, in, indeed, Ian, as your that, brilliant you know, book points out, experiment. we're very lucky to have certain states in America, uh, like, for example, Florida and Texas, who had a light touch compared to California and New York, similar outcomes. We're lucky that we had Sweden because they are controls in the experiment. Now, your book, uh, part of the title is The Collapse of Expertise. And, and a real worry about um, the future is the lack of public respect for the so-called experts, uh, the government, the medics, the professors who took us down this road. Um, what do you feel about that? The idea now for some that science is a four-letter word. Yeah, I think that's one of the most dangerous kind of underreported aspects of the pandemic. And I have a great respect for expertise, and obviously we need it in most of our lives. But I think that their, their lack of humility and a lack of willingness to admit mistakes and acknowledge that they messed up is, is what's harming them down the road. You know, people would have a lot more respect, I think, if they just said, you know, look, we didn't we didn't have all the best information or we did the best with what we, we knew at the time. We turns out we weren't right. You know, we're sorry. We're going to learn from this and do better with the next time. That's not what they're saying. It's just been very defiant and, and kind of refusing to say, look, we didn't do we, we messed this up and, and we'll try to fix it. But, uh, yeah, hopefully they, they do finally admit that. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but that's my hope. Well, I hope your book will add to that conversation. 
Ian, you have to ask why this virus, which was nasty, of course, and, and it took too many people, it killed many loved ones, but it was a very age-specific virus and it focused on the vulnerable. Um, why did it provoke such a massive reaction from governments around the world? Why did we have lockdowns? Why did we keep healthy people at home? Why did we vaccinate healthy people? What's behind all of this, do you think? Oh, I think that there's a lot, there was a lot of fear and panic, especially early on. And I think China is in large part responsible mm -hmm. for that. I mean, you, you can go back and look now at those videos of people falling down in the streets in China, Wuhan, supposedly dying from COVID, just walking around. So there was this kind of uh, unnecessary fear and panic initially. And then there were estimates from the World Health Organization that something like three and a half percent of people that got COVID were going to die. And that was way catastrophically off. But governments believed that. They saw this modeling from the UK as Imperial College. Here we had modeling too showing, oh, if we don't do all these lockdowns, we're going to have huge consequences. Um, and so it all kind of springs from that, where health authorities panicked and overreacted. And then you, know, you have years of policies trying to kind of let, not admit that they were overreacting to a, a virus that was very dangerous, but had a very specific age grading, as you say. They just didn't want to admit that they were wrong from the beginning. And, and so you have years of kind of just covering up for their own failures. Well, in looking back on the pandemic, your book will be an important historic document. It's a cracking read. I'm halfway through it. It is called Illusion of Control, COVID-19 and the Collapse of Expertise. It is by Ian Miller and it's out now. Thanks, Ian. We'll catch up soon. Thanks very much. Now, coming up in Dial Dolan, when I'm taking your video calls, is my colleague and friend Nigel Farage right that politicians have failed us on Brexit? And also, are men still useless around the house? That's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to the show. At nine o'clock, in my big opinion, I'll be making the case for love bombing the rich. That sounds strange, but find out why after nine. And at ten, in my take at ten, I'll be dealing with Harry and Meghan and their so-called car chase. But this week, GB News star Nigel Farage said that politicians have failed us on Brexit. With ongoing alignment with the EU and record amounts of unchecked migration into the country, is he right? Let's put that to my viewers and listeners in another instalment of Dial Dolan, in which I take your video calls on the national airwaves. So to discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome Robin, who joins us from gorgeous Gay Paris, Amanda in East Sussex and Fergus in Greenwich. Uh, what do you think, Amanda? Has this government dropped the ball on Brexit? Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. Yes, yes, absolutely. They have completely failed us. And um, I don't think I've ever been so disillusioned about politics in all my life because I'm one of those that is now politically homeless. Um, I don't think I'll even bother voting in the next election if I still am in the country by then because I'm looking for ways to leave because of all these shenanigans with the Conservative Party and everything they've done to. Um, Voiced Rishi Sunak upon us all, which never, ever was going to work. And I'll give you an example of why, because they did this um, to the Italian people with Mario Draghi, if you mm. remember. Yeah. Um, they had a big turmoil in their political um, uh, world over there, and they ended up being stuck with um, someone who was chosen by the EU, basically. And I believe that EU wanted Rishi Sunak very much so and now we're stuck with him and I just don't see any way out of this because even if they bring Boris back is it going to be enough to turn things around in time for the next election my hope is that they will actually replace Rishi because I've lost all faith in whatever he thinks he's doing I don't trust him I don't like him I don't believe in him I think he's a terrible weak leader he's not even a leader He's just weak. And Brexit has been completely put on the back burner by, you know, by Rishi. I think he did a bit of a deal with Ursula von der Leyen when he went um, to sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think he did agree, as some of the Brexiteer MPs feel, I think he did agree that we would align uh, with EU rules throughout the whole of the <coughs> UK, which we've now been told is going to be the case because people that have gone through that deal, the Windsor framework, have realised that when they uh, align Northern Ireland with EU rules, it's going to affect the rest of the UK as well. So we really only have, as Nigel Farage has said many, many times, we only have Brexit in name only. And I am so disappointed. I want to pack my bags and I want to leave and move and go as far away from this Conservative Party in this country as possible. I just cannot take it anymore with the politics over here. It's really, really getting me down. Well, that's a damning assessment. And Fergus, you're nodding your head. Yes. Everything she said, yes, basically. <laughs> Nigel is abrasive, aggressive. There would be zero Brexit without Nigel. It never would have happened. And he fought for it for 28 years, was it? 27, 28 years? He fought mad for it, and everybody had goes at him. Without him, there would have been no Brexit at all. And they're clawing back, clawing back, clawing back. Rishi, uh, Keir Starmer, all of them, they just don't want it. They don't want to get rid of 4,000 rules and laws. No, no, no. Let's get rid of 10 or 20. And as the lady just said, yeah, the Northern Ireland Protocol is wrong. We haven't got our fisheries back. We haven't got anything back. It's been... A, a step away by Labour and Conservatives, and it's like, oh, what's going to happen? 
I don't know. Thank goodness for Nigel, who's, and also, of course, for GB News, haha, <laughs> because it's the only place you can get a spoken what's really happening in politics. And However, I wonder, Robin, whether Brexiteers are allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We are out. We've got a free, free trade deal with the European Union. We, you know, we don't have uh, contributions to the bloc every month and uh, we don't have the euro. We're out. What's the problem? Um, OK, so Nigel was right in what he said, but anybody could have said that. Because, to be honest with you, um, Brexit has been an absolute disaster. But, I, you know, many people would have told you that before it happened. There was absolutely nothing that was on the table that was ever going to make this anything other than a disaster. Um, and, I, you know, I love what Amanda was saying, but she can't leave the country because one of the issues I've got with Brexit is I would like to retire abroad. I'd like to go and live in Portugal or Spain, but I can't do that now, thanks to Brexit. Also, Brexit affects me from a business perspective. The other week I was in uh, Budapest. I had to queue up with all the other, other, pass, uh, other passport lane because I can't go through the EU ones, even though they were empty and they were staffed, but they just kept us waiting there. And that, you know, that, if you never travel, you never see this. But also in my business, GDPR is unbelievably important. Now, I'm banned from looking at European data of some of our clients because guess what? I live in the UK. I don't live in Europe. So for me, Brexit has been nothing other than an unmitigated disaster. And so, of course, Nigel's right. But Nigel basically sold us this or sold the country this. And now he's trying to distance himself because he hasn't got what he thought he was going to get. However, Robin, it's a transition, isn't it? It's a huge shock to the economy. It's complicated in terms of the law, customs, you name it. This will take a while to bed in. Surely you can't judge Brexit for a decade. Plus, the EU has many problems in its own right, including a potential sovereign debt crisis in France, Spain and the aforementioned Portugal. Nothing. I mean, yes, Mark. I mean, nothing's perfect. And maybe one day somebody will turn around in 10 or 20 years time and go, actually, you know what? It was the best thing we ever did. And OK, if that's how it turns out to be fantastic. But unfortunately, that's way too late for me because mm -hmm. everything is costing more money these days. And, you know, I'm, I'm here in Paris at the moment for a month and it's fantastic and it's a lot cheaper than being in London, I can assure you. OK, well, look, let me ask you, Amanda, Assuming that you supported Brexit, would you rather that we were still in the European Union? Is what we have now worse than membership of the bloc? Good question. Very good question. I'm going to have to say that I would still vote for Brexit if if we had, you know, the, the chance to sort of re redo things, which we won't. But thank goodness for that, because that would just cause another problem. Um, but the thing is, the most <clears throat> disappointing aspect of it is that we don't have control of our borders. Hello. We have thousands of people coming into this country in dinghy boats, making us the laughing stock of the world. And we don't seem to be able to solve that problem. No. I think they're doing it to us on purpose. I think Rishi Sunak is quite happy to let it continue. I have my own reasons why I believe in that, but I won't go into it. And I think this is an agenda that we are not going to see end anytime soon. That's what disturbs me the most, that they are disregarding and disrespecting Brexit in the name of something else that they're not being honest with us about with regards to mass migration to this country. And it really sickens me to my stomach. That's why I want to leave, because the more we get inundated with these illegal migrants and hotels, you know, being taken over, people's weddings being cancelled, people being turfed out of okay. different well, places to Amanda, make space for these people. You I know? stop you only, only because of time, but you speak for many of my viewers. Next up, we're losing billionaires. Why is that happening and why is it a problem? That is next.
It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. It's nine o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, it's been revealed Britain now has fewer billionaires. Why is this bad news for you and me? Well, because this war on wealth might win a cheap headline, but it's a race to the bottom and will hurt the poorest in our society. Find out why we need rich people shortly. In my take a 10, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and their wildly exaggerated claims of a car chase. These true, these two, I should say, are driving me around the bend. You won't want to miss my verdict on Harry and Meghan after 10. Do wear a seatbelt. Why have the NHS decided that there are now 18 genders? And these are the people looking after our health. I'll be putting that to tonight's newsmaker, free speech champion, Toby Young. Plus some breaking news regarding the very popular podcast Trigonometry. Well, they've been defunded by their bank. Why? Because they host people who have a variety of political views. It's censorship gone mad. And the co-creator of Trigonometry, Konstantin Kissin, joins us after 10. A busy, lively, fun and provocative two hours to come. It's Friday night, folks. The weekend starts here. So treat yourself. Put something cold and fizzy in the fridge or fire up the kettle. Tear open the custard creams and let's make a night of it. Happy Friday, one and all. My big opinion is next. But first, the headlines with Rory Smith.
Cheers, Mark. The latest from the GB Newsroom. A man who conned victims out of more than £100 million has been jailed. TJ Fletcher founded the website iSpook, which allowed criminals to make phone calls to victims pretending they were from trusted companies. It was brought down last year in the UK's biggest fraud sting. The 35-year-old has been sentenced to 13 years and four months in prison. Detective Superintendent Helen Rance says he clearly didn't care about the harm he was causing. Before it was shut down, iSpoof was constantly growing, with 700 new users registering every week, and it was earning £80,000 per week. Fletcher was leading an extravagant lifestyle, benefiting from the profits, having no care for the misery he was responsible for. The parents of a disabled teenager who were jailed for her gross negligence manslaughter have had their sentences increased. Kayleigh Titford, who was morbidly obese and bedridden, died at her home in Newton in 2020 after suffering from an infection. Her mother, Sarah Lloyd-Jones, who admitted the charge, will now serve eight years instead of six. And her father, Alan, who pleaded not guilty, will serve ten years. The brother of TV star Philip Schofield has been jailed for 12 years for child sex offences. Timothy Schofield, who was a civilian police worker, committed 11 offences between 2016 and 2019. The boy, who was abused by the 54-year-old, was praised for his remarkable bravery in coming forward. The US has announced new sanctions on Russia targeting future energy revenues and military supply chains. Well, it's part of a wave of fresh punishments over the war in Ukraine, which have been announced by G7 leaders at a meeting in Japan. Earlier, the UK said it would be banning imports of Russian diamonds, copper, aluminium and nickel. Well, Ukraine's president has met the Saudi crown prince Mohammed bin Salman on the sidelines of the Arab League summit in Jeddah. Vladimir Zelensky has also held meetings with the leaders of Oman, Kuwait and the UAE. Gulf countries have tried to remain neutral on the war in Ukraine, but in a speech to the summit, President Zelensky called out those who have been turning a blind eye. The Ministry of Defence has awarded contracts worth £320 million to service Royal Navy offshore patrol vessels. UK Docks Marine Services in the North East has been given an eight-year contract worth around £250 million to support vessels, including HMS Timor. That's expected to create around 100 jobs. A second contract worth £70 million has gone to BAE Systems in Portsmouth. Boris Johnson's wife, Carrie, is pregnant with the couple's third child. She announced on Instagram they're expecting a sibling for Wilf and Romy in just a few weeks' time. Well, Carrie said she's been feeling pretty exhausted for much of the last eight months, but they are looking forward to welcoming the newest member of the family very soon. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn, this is GB News. Now, though, back to Mark. Congratulations to Boris Johnson and news of his 350th child. We wish mum and baby well. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, it's been revealed now that Britain has fewer billionaires. Why is this bad news for you and me? Well, because this war on wealth might win a cheap headline, but it's a race to the bottom and will hurt the poorest in our society. Find out why we need rich people shortly. In my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and their wildly exaggerated claims of a car chase. These two are driving me around the bend. You won't want to miss my verdict after 10. Do wear a seatbelt. In the big story is the case for net zero crumbling. Top journalist Ross Clark joins me and he's been writing about how Europe is turning against net zero, whilst we, a bunch of mugs, are bankrupting ourselves to cut carbon emissions. Also, this is fascinating, why do people murder? 
My Mark Meets guest is the forensic psychiatrist whose job it is to rehabilitate some of the worst monsters in our society. Can they be cured? And why have the NHS decided that there are now 18 genders? That's right, 18 genders. I'll be putting that to tonight's newsmaker, free speech champion, Toby Young. Plus, some shocking news. The very popular podcast, Trigonometry, which invites guests across the political spectrum to come and talk to their show. Well, they've been cancelled by their own bank. We'll find out why from their co-founder, Konstantin Kissin, after 10. Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages at exactly 10.30 sharp. You can set your watch to it with a full pundit reaction. And tonight, three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, Peter Edwards, Ingrid Tarrant and Albie Amancona. Tonight, I'll be asking the pundits, was the Queen's funeral worth £162 million? Will Keir Starmer sleepwalk us back into the EU? And should obesity be renamed so people aren't offended? Plus, your emails, especially the spicy ones, mark at gbnews.uk. And this show has a golden rule. We don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it, especially on a Friday night. The weekend starts here. Let's have some fun. Let's have a debate and let's have a laugh as well. And we start with my big opinion. The Sunday Times rich list is out. Rishi Sunak's family is worth a cool £500 million. Rock superstar Elton John is still standing with a personal wealth of £450 million, worth every penny. We love Elton. And cheesy love song specialist Ed Sheeran is valued at £300 million. What do all those girls see in him? But as my brilliant colleague Tom Harwood points out on Twitter today, for the first time in 14 years, the number of billionaires on the Sunday Times rich list has fallen to 171. This is, he says, a policy failure. Well, Tom Harwood is absolutely right, and let me explain why. Of course, it's very sad that we live in a world, and indeed a country, where one person can drive around in a gold-plated Rolls Royce, whilst another barely has a roof over their head. But the great misunderstanding of some on the left is that the way that you help those at the bottom is somehow to attack the wealthy. Now, that may seem like a sensible idea on paper, but I'm afraid history tells us it just doesn't work. It's my view that by scaring off billionaires and creating an environment unwelcoming to those who make something of their lives, who take risks and who work hard, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, making ourselves poorer and killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's crazy that you have very rich and very poor, but we've tried alternatives, including many communist regimes that through history have bankrupted countries and seen the poorer get poorer. Transferring to a market economy has seen countries in Eastern Europe and across Asia lift billions of people out of poverty. Capitalism is not perfect. It's unequal. It needs to be controlled and kept in check, but it works. And when calibrated correctly and allowed to do what it's designed to do, capitalism delivers for all. Now, before you think that I want a society of haves and have-nots, far from it, I believe in taxation. And it's got to be high enough to deliver great public services and offer support to those less fortunate. But not so high that it impacts investment, economic growth, and sees a mass exodus of the well-heeled. Remember, these days, the rich are mobile. So bashing the wealthy, inspiring them to live in other places might make a good political headline. It might feel like just revenge on people with swimming pools and helicopter pads. And it might even win some cynical politicians a few votes. But the painful truth is that we need rich people and we're lucky to have them. We need their tax income. We need their investment. We need the businesses they create. We need the innovation that they are behind. And we need them to go shopping in this country. The VAT alone on a top-level Rolls-Royce, designed and built by British workers in Britain, is upwards of £100,000. The VAT on one Rolls-Royce. 
So a rich person buys a posh car and we get 100 grand straight into the nation's coffers. And you want to get rid of these people. How does that work? Yes, they've got to pay their share, absolutely. But in most cases, it's a great myth that they don't. In figures relating to 2019, the wealthiest 1% of the population, that's right, the wealthiest 1% paid 30% of all income tax. And the wealthiest 10% paid 60% of all taxes. A brave chancellor would give up all of that. Well, the billionaires that we've already lost have taken their money with them. Well done, everyone. With the highest tax burden since the Second World War and with the prospect of an incoming Labour government who have a cultural hatred of aspiration and wealth, it looks like Britain's futile and self-destructive war on wealth will continue. But by impoverishing the nation, it will hurt the poorest the most. A rich country with a massive gross domestic product and with rich people in it spending their money is one which can deliver for all. That is what prosperity looks like, as we saw in Britain and America in the 1980s, with a massive expansion of the middle class and millions of working class people daring for the first time ever to dream big for their own lives. There are plenty of high profile progressives who love to go around wearing T-shirts that say, eat the rich. Well, they'll be eating their words when we see the consequences of scaring off wealth creators. It's time to love bomb rich people. We need them and we need their money. The current war on wealth is nothing less than a race to the bottom. Will the last rich person to leave Britain please switch off the lights before you go? Dark times lie ahead unless we change course. Your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.uk. I realise it's a bit of a hard sell, the idea of defending the super rich, but look how much they pay in taxes. Look how much investment and innovation they bring when they come here. Otherwise, they'll go to Paris, New York or Dubai. Is that better for Britain? I don't think so, but what's your view? Let's get the opinions now of my fantastic pundits tonight. I'm delighted to welcome journalist and the former editor of Labour List, Peter Edwards. Broadcaster and TV host Ingrid Tarrant and GB News star and financial analyst Albie Amancona. So, Peter, let me start with you. Uh, your reaction to the news that there are now fewer billionaires in Britain. This is terrible, isn't it? No, I think in isolation <laughs> it's meaningless. I mean, your, your, your monologue's always very witty, though. I, I did think a lot of it was Codswallop. It uh, rely, relied on anecdotal evidence. I, I don't think taking billionaires as a measure of success or failure or our receptiveness to wealth and business is the right measure at all. I checked while you were speaking. The total uh, receipts for HMRC, for tax and national insurance, actually rose in the last year to just under £800 billion. So that would imply there isn't a war on the well, wealthy first of all. Secondly, why, why am I so sceptical about measuring uh, a country about its billionaire status? Because in some cases, being a billionaire means several other million people have had some bad luck along the way. So there are great British success stories like Dyson and very clever people globally like Warren Buffett. But then there are other investors who uh, don't always do the right thing. So, for example, Bill Gates is an incredibly clever man, mm. but, but Microsoft has repeatedly broken antitrust and anti-competition rules and regulations in Europe and in other parts of the world. Or well, I should say Bill Gates obviously done a lot in retirement in terms of anti-malaria stuff. But just being a billionaire means getting very rich, but, but then it means getting very rich at someone else's expense. Finally, I don't mm. think there's a war on wealth. And if you look at the Labour Party today, it's all about trying to grow the economy again. The parties have coalesced around that message. Uh, what is a war on wealth, if not the highest level of taxation since the Second World War? But we all know why that is a COVID, and we don't need to rehash the arguments about lockdown, but that, that was the biggest driver. And uh, I think in the last update from the OBR, who were the independent forecaster, they said there were two clear reasons um, why the economy's uh, growth had been held back. COVID 
and Brexit. And we can argue about those, but they are the reasons. Well, I think, Ingrid, it's bad news if Britain is losing billionaires. I said in my big opinion, it's very sad that we live in an unequal world. But if these rich people leave Britain, they will spend their money somewhere else. Yes, of course they will. I don't think Brexit and um, COVID really has anything to do with it because it was that before that and it will continue. Can you continue? Like a decline. Yes, it will just continue because it's an it, easy target. Um, the, um, the structure of the tax is not fair. The there's, there's stealth tax that gets involved in that as well, which, you know, the hidden taxes and, yeah. and things like that. And you're absolutely right. When you say sort of like you're killing the, the goose that lays a golden egg, if you don't have that person at the top, you look at what that person creates all the way down. And it's not just an employment, it's an expenditure, putting money into the economy, buying the Rolls Royce, as you say, that puts that feeds it into the economy, that keeps those people. It's a huge ripple effect um, from which everybody ultimately benefits. If they've got it, they're going to spend it. And if they're going to spend it, they need people around them to, to facilitate whatever it is that they buy, they do, they travel, they want. You know, I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's grossly... Um, um, unfair to suggest that they don't deserve it. They've, they've been intelligent. Yes, it's true. People have probably had opportunities that they haven't recognised and they've made mistakes mm. and they've become the millionaire, not the billionaire, or they've never even become the, the millionaire in the first place. That is just life. That's, we're, we're not robots. It's the way that we live our lives. We, we make choices and sometimes we make the wrong choices. But we shouldn't be... Nobody should be penalised that hasn't got the money, that, that isn't a millionaire that's actually on the poverty line, or that is a billionaire. OK. I it's mean, life. Albie, attacking the rich makes headlines. It might win votes, but it damages the country. Look, I think ultimately, of course, it's a bad thing to see the number of billionaires in the United Kingdom. But many on the left down. would celebrate. Come, well, I, I think that is a misguided celebration. Mm. But equally, I would agree with Peter that judging the success of a country purely based on a number of billionaires is probably a bit of a crude measure to mm. decide whether. It's not, not a good Britain. sign, though, is it? Well, it's, it's not a good sign. I mean, I would like Britain sign. to it's be a, the home of the billionaires. I would like Britain to be a... I want it to be a to magnet be a for the super-rich. ..country, but <laughs> I don't know that measuring the number of billionaires is the best measure of prosperity. There are many different prosperity indexes It's a good sign, there. though, isn't it? It's, it's a, a good, good sign. I mean, I mean, you're a financial for analyst. Example, for example, the Legatum Institute has something called a prosperity index where mm. it takes into account a number of different factors, and it's not just based on how many billionaires there are in the country. So I just think when we, when we look at things through these crude measures of how many billionaires are there, yes, it generates a headline, yes, it generates a talking point. But it does make really the world go round. Money policy, does make the world go round. And, it's that, and that is the, um, the point. I, I, I actually I totally agree with you, because I do think it is a measure. I think it's a measure of how this country provides opportunities for people to become rich. It goes back to Thatcher's days with the uppies. You know, the, the young... Upwardly mobile. Upwardly mobile professional. The, the young urban professionals, it was, wasn't mm -hmm. it? And look what happened. From there emerged this a wealth of very clever people that seized the opportunity, made the opportunity, and actually became rich off the back of it. We shouldn't thwart that, because it then... It, prevents people from wanting to and achieve. Actually, yeah. For example, China has more billionaires than the United, than the United Kingdom. Would you say that China was a more successful country for most but of the people that, living but in But is that number or percentage? No, but I mean, this is why I it's say the number sign. of billionaires... I agree, it's not the only metric. It's, it's not the only metric way to, to measure a country's success. It's not the only metric, but I still think it's a significant one. Your reaction, let me know, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Next up, you won't believe this story. Some big EU countries are pushing back on the plan to cut carbon emissions. The Germans are now digging for coal. Is the case for net zero crumbling? That's next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. 
all sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Well, look, a big reaction to my big opinion. I've been defending billionaires. We need them in this country. We need them to spend their money in Britain and to invest here. This from Richard. Hi, Mark. Billionaires are leaving because they're fed up with the high-tax, wealth-hating, bloated state landscape that the country seems to be morphing into. We should celebrate success, not look at it with envy or use the rich as a cash point to raise money. If we keep doing this, the billionaire tax take will soon be empty. Christine, good evening. How are you? Thank you for your email, mark at gbnews.uk. Evening, Mark, says Christine. Margaret Thatcher was very successful in creating a snatch-and-grab society. If you want it, just snatch it, no matter who you trample on. This is not success. So, Christine there, pushing back on my sunny recollections of the 1980s. Lynn says tax receipts rose because the Tories are taxing the middle classes to the point they're also leaving. The other half of the country lives on their taxes, a.k.a. benefits, known coyly as the state to their entitled minds. Money grows on trees and it comes from the rich. Labour are living in the 19th century. Oh, look, I'll get to more of your emails shortly. Always fascinating, but it's time now for the big story. And the spectator journalist Ross Clark has written that Europe is turning against net zero, with Germany tackling the energy crisis by, wait for it, reopening coal mines. The German energy giant RWE is removing a wind farm to dig for lignite, the dirtiest form of coal. And the fortunes of Germany's Green Party are in reverse with its share of the vote plunging to its lowest level in 20 years. Meanwhile, as Ross Clark points out in The Spectator, the French president Emmanuel Macron has changed his tune as well, asserting that Europe has gone far enough in passing laws to abate carbon emissions, and it's now the turn of other countries. Even woke Joe Biden has declined to set any kind of target, still less a legally binding one, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 or any other date. He has continued to approve new oil and gas drilling in Alaska. And we know that fracking is a massive part of the American energy mix. So, is the case for net zero crumbling? And is the appetite for it beginning to diminish? To discuss this, I'm delighted to say that Ross Clark joins me now. 
And Ross, as other countries back off, we're the mugs here bankrupting ourselves to cut carbon emissions. Well, that's exactly what Emmanuel Macron has come to the conclusion. And while Europe has been tying its hands behind its back um, with, with these legally binding um, net zero targets, um, the world's biggest polluters, US and China, they're not setting legally binding targets. Um, what is Joe Biden doing? He's just um, passed this what euphemistically named Inflation Reduction Act, which is really a $400 billion bung to green industries in America. Um, it's, it's basically a, a protectionist device. And um, what Biden's mm. saying is, well, you know, I want people to buy electric cars. I want them to buy heat pumps and so on. But they've got to be American cars and they've got to be American heat pumps. And, um, you know, this this has gradually dawned on the EU. Well, you know, if, if US is going to um, come over protectionists like this, well, it, it could rip a lot of the heart out of um, European industry. And already we, we've had um, businesses in Britain and Europe which have thought, well, you know, well, rather than... Um, uh, you know, carry on in Europe. Well, well let's re relocate our operations to um, America, where we can get a slice of these huge, um, the, these these huge subsidies that have been handed out. And um, Macron's basically had enough. And what he's saying is that Europe has gone far enough for the moment in um, greening itself, greening its industry and so on. If we go ahead at a faster speed than the rest of the world, all that's going to happen is we're going to lose our industry. Our industry is going to drain away to the US and China. Um, but the sad thing is that um, Britain is, seems to be a bit lagging behind on this. Um, mm. uh, you know, it, the penny has yet to drop in Britain uh, in the way that it has with Emmanuel Macron. Yes, and also I wonder whether elsewhere the penny is beginning to drop that these sustainable sources of energy are pushing up the cost of energy for consumers and they're not very reliable. Plus, electric cars are difficult to charge. Well, well, exactly. I mean, one of the reasons um, industry has been draining away to uh, Southeast Asia from Europe for years and years is because uh, of cheap um, energy prices. And, um, you know, China is, um, you know, it, it's a big investor in green energy, biggest uh, manufacturer of solar panels, biggest investor in, in wind, uh, wind farms. But mm -hmm. it's also the world's biggest investor in coal plants. It's a, you know, this great growing industry in China it, it wants they want energy from all forms and um, you know what we're doing in in Europe though and particularly in Britain is we're saying you know we, we're going to tie ourselves uh, tie our arms behind our backs by only having sort of wind and solar trying to get by on wind and solar alone and and what it's going to mean is that um, you know high energy consumers and steel making, cement making and all manner of other industries will, will find it, have this huge incentive now to uh, relocate to China and well now to America as well with Biden's great green bungs. Now, of course, it's worth pointing out that the majority of mainstream scientists take the view that the planet is heating up. It's going to cause huge economic and ecological problems. It's going to be a humanitarian crisis as well. There will be mass migration. It will be chaos, say the experts. Uh, we've got to get those carbon emissions down in order to stop the damage. However, um, what do you think about the long term? I mean, do you see net zero ever really happening? No one's ever satisfactorily answered this question, which is what's the point of countries like Bits Britain uh, reducing their carbon emissions at great cost if countries like China and Brazil and India do not? Yeah, I mean, as you say, there is every incentive for, for the world to invest in green energy, to move away from carbon emissions and eventually to attain carbon neutrality. But um, there, there is really no point in um, a few small countries moving ahead of others while th those big emitters aren't you know, following suit. And um, what we've got at the moment is, um, you know, when, when this... Uh, zero carbon 
a commitment was um, nodded through Parliament in 2019 without even a vote, as we said. Um, the idea was that we would manage to inspire the rest of the world to follow suit. Well, we inspired a few other European countries. France made the same commitment in the same week as we did. Uh, but, you know, three years on, um, four years on now, indeed, um, you know, there's a maximum of around 17 countries which have made a legally binding net zero commitment. Some of them have, you know, minnows like Fiji and Luxembourg, which hardly have any significant um, emissions in the first place. But whereas the really big emitters, China and the US, Russia, you know, they have not you know, made these legally binding commitments in the way we have. And, um, you know, if it goes on like this, where Europe's just sort of um, uh, undermining its industry and, and the rest of the world isn't, well, you know, as I say, all that's going to happen is the industry is going to go out to those uh, big emitters, the Chinas and the Americas, and um, it doesn't achieve anything on a global scale. In fact, it makes things worse because, you know, if you make a ton of steel in Britain, well, it's um, using pretty clean um, electricity. We, we have very little coal-fired uh, power um, in Britain anymore. It's mostly wind, solar and gas. Um, but, you know, if you make that ton of steel in China, well, it's going to be made with um, coal-fired electricity, which is, you know, far dirtier. So, we, it, you know, the net zero commitment, the, the sort of unilateral net zero commitments, actually making things worse from a global point of view. A great piece in The Spectator. My thanks to uh, the brilliant journalist and writer, uh, the one and only Ross Clark. Thanks, Ross. We'll catch up soon. Uh, we've been asking you online as European nations push back on eco measures, is the case for net zero crumbling? The results are in. 91.4% say yes, whereas a meagre 86 back net zero. Coming up next with my pundits, was the Queen's funeral worth £162 million? Will Keir Starmer sleepwalk us back into the EU? And should obesity be renamed so people aren't offended? That's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the case for net zero crumbling? Let me be clear that most mainstream scientists, most governments around the world, most experts say the planet is heating up. We've got to get those emissions down. But you do not agree, Mark, at GBNews.UK. Ronald says, hi, Mark, come on, we've all had enough of net zero. Just rip up the so-called agreements and follow the rest of the grown-up world. Jack, uh, Jackie says, hi, Mark, looking lovely in yellow. Well, thank you for that. Bless you for the kind compliment. Net zero is a ploy by Russia and China to get rid of the annoying West. Then the field is free for them to rule the world. Plus, electric cars are not better for the environment. They're destroying it, but in a different way. Uh, Daniel says, Mark, the Germans are two-faced hypocrites. When the UK was part of the EU, it was the Germans who were dictating to us to cut our emissions when it was they and the French who released more than us. And Daryl says, evening, Mark, Europe has got the right idea. Climate change is nothing new. It's happened many times before, and no amount of net zero nonsense is going to stop it. Let's get on with life. Stop falling for the eco-mentalist claptrap, uh, clap I should say, and enjoy the warmer summers. Thank you, Daryl. Keep those emails coming. <laughs> Mark at gbnews.uk. Where is that warm summer? It's a cold spring, isn't it? <laughs> Reacting to the big stories of the day, my top pundits, Peter Edwards, former editor of Labour List and political commentator, broadcaster and TV presenter Ingrid Tarrant, and Albia Mancona, financial analyst, political commentator and GB News star, of course, one of the presenters of the brand new GB News hit show, The Saturday Five. Now, this week, the Treasury revealed the total cost of the Queen's funeral and lying in state cost the taxpayer £162 million. Pounds. A quarter of a million people queued to pay their respects during the lying in state, and more than 2,000 guests attended the straight state funeral. The Met Police said the funeral was the biggest policing event in history, but was it worth the money? Albie? Do you know, I would have said yes initially, mm. but then I saw how much other state funerals costed in the past and the cost of Princess Diana's funeral, which wasn't a state funeral, but if we did that in today's money, it would have costed £8 million. Winston Churchill's funeral back in 1965, so a long time ago, almost 60 years now, would cost £1 million in today's money. So I just wonder, why did the Queen's funeral cost so much more than these other massive state occasions? However, it was a celebration of her life, and was it not a celebration of our culture and our traditions too? Wasn't it really a chance to show off GB Limited? Of course it was. But I just think when you compare that cost to some of the other costs for similar events, mm. you just wonder why for this event it was so much more expensive and if it was value for money. Peter? Um, well, I wouldn't give a straight answer whether it's value for money because I think it's just the right thing to have done. Uh, if you're not going to celebrate the life of your longest ever serving monarch, then whose life are you going to celebrate? Clearly, obviously, any public spending has to be totted up and paid for and we're the ones that pay for it for our taxes. But, but it was the right thing to do. And I've not heard, we can have a debate about uh, the monarchy and it's fair enough that Republicans um, get their two pennies worth in, but I've not heard anyone say that uh, we shouldn't have done as we did in uh, recent months with the Queen's funeral. So it was absolutely the right thing to do. Ingrid, could a celebration of our late great Queen be done on the cheap? No, I don't think it could at all, because when you look at every... Um, uh, factor that went into it, the army, the military, the marines, all that, um, the carriage, you can't do it on the cheap. You just can't. This is all, this is so very British. It's all the splendour, the pomp and the ceremony and so on. I will say, because uh, people just look at it and it'll be people that sort of probably aren't working, going, well, we should have that money, you know, sort of entitlement and everything, um, that the, it cost actually 70p per person, a tax-paying person, um, to put that on. Um, and compared to the, the US presidential cost, it's 200 million that they spend on that every four years, when they have, whether it's the, 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 on the inauguration, whether it's the same president um, yeah. again or not. But the, the, the revenue that it generates, you, it's no point just looking at 162 million 
Mm. You have to also look at the, the revenue that it generates. And, you know, it was watched by four, over four billion people in the world. She was loved. You couldn't do that cheap. That's what they expect. And this is very British, so very British. That's such a, gr a great way of putting it. Um, because w there might be lots of things we disagree on, but if we were talking about our own family member and someone said, did you spend too much, we'd say, how dare you ask? They were our mum, our father, the person we loved. That's a great point, I think, you made, Ingrid, because th that's how many people felt about the Queen. Um, we're going to cover the Keir Starmer story. Is Labour going to take us back into Europe during the papers? Because a couple of interesting stories are bubbling up. Don't forget at 10.30, we've got tomorrow's front pages. But next up, in order to avoid stigmatising people and reflect the hereditary nature of the disease, researchers have claimed obesity should be renamed. They've suggested the illness could be rebranded as chronic appetite dysregulation. It's thought the change could help encourage people to seek treatment. So should we rename obesity, Ingrid? Yeah. Fatty. Ouch. No, Surely honestly, that's very I'm offensive, so... very triggering yeah, to people. I know, I know, but really... I've I never mean... been called fatty before, but thank no, you. No, but how would you feel if you were being called skinny? I get it all the time. Yeah, but is it, a, is, it a, is it derogatory? Statement of fact. No, I tell you what, I mean, that was a little bit sort of um, flippant, I have to say. Chronic appetite dysregulation, I mean, that is completely ridiculous. What it is, is they're eating too much, they're not getting enough exercise, they're eating junk food and they are going to become obese. How else do you describe it? That is actually, you could be slim, you could be perfectly, you know, the, the medium frame. It's like a, with sizing. What's going to happen there? X, 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 L. Will that be offensive as well? Because that means it's extra, 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 extra large. Why don't we just go extra, extra large then, person? Well, the problem is... Small, Albie, extra, small, the, medium. The idea of changing the words... First of all, it doesn't change reality, which is if someone's very overweight, that's a health issue. But also, it's the idea that obesity is a disease. Well, it's not a disease, is it? It's a lifestyle-related condition. It is a lifestyle-related condition. I think there are probably two arguments here. There were some words that was common to describe a black person in the past. We would never use them now because it's too offensive. Yeah. So someone might argue that this is the natural evolution of language and obesity, calling someone obese is offensive to someone who is obese. Although but obese would... is not slang, going back to well, the horrific descriptions of a, of a black person in the past, Obesity is not a slur, is it? I mean, obesity is already quite a medical term. Well, of course, but there were words back then, which I will not repeat, which were just common language, right. which now we would which say were were accepted. Offensive, yeah. Which were accepted back then. OK. But I would argue something different, mm. which is that, actually, I don't think being called obese needs to be offensive. I no. used to be obese. It was a matter of fact. And did you I'm no longer it? obese. Well, yes. yes. I so would say, when I was younger, I was obese. When I was fat, I was fat. I didn't get offended by my, me describing myself Was it fat. helpful that people were using such direct language? Or would it be unhelpful to say you're perfect as you are and you've just got a disorder? No, I don't think that would be helpful at all. Mm. But equally, I think if someone says you are an obese expletive, mm. that's offensive. But just describing someone as obese, that's just an angry Because it's critical. That's really critical, Precisely. isn't it? But it's being honest. How did you lose the weight? Well, this is actually quite a tragic story. I basically had septicemia and I was in intensive care in St Mary's Hospital just around the corner right. for weeks and I basically woke up skinny. That's amazing. And then, but you changed skinny. your lifestyle. Skinny, the word skinny. You tried, you <laughs> changed your lifestyle after that, though, because you could have put yes, it all back I, on. I, I just didn't put the weight back on, basically. Great. Well, I'm glad you're well again. And, of course, you're back tomorrow for the Saturday Five. Looking forward to that. Uh, next up, why do people murder? My Mark Meets guest is the forensic psychiatrist whose job it is to rehabilitate some of the worst monsters in our society. Can they be cured? That's next. And don't forget, at 10 o'clock, just 15 minutes away, I'll be dealing with Harry and Meghan and their fake car chase. See you shortly. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now, and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel, and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. 
I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back to the show. It's time now for this. It's time now for Mark Meets. And tonight, why do people commit some of the darkest crimes, including murder? Dr. Shahom Das is a forensic psychiatrist who treats the so-called criminally insane, many of whom assault, rob, rape or even kill. His work takes him to high security prisons and secure hospital wards across the country as well as inside courtrooms, giving evidence as an expert witness. He's put it all into a book, which is called In Two Minds, Stories of Murder, Justice and Recovery from a Forensic Psychiatrist. And I'm delighted to say Dr. Shahom Das joins me now. Congratulations on the release of the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Uh, let's make some noise about that book. First of all, what got you into this field of medicine? So I've got to be honest, I, when I went to medical school, I didn't really have a plan, didn't mm. really feel connected to or passionate about any of the topics that I did. Okay. You weren't like, I'm obsessed with the liver. E exactly. Or yeah. Yeah. anything like that. Nothing that really, you know, floated my boat until I did psychiatry. Mm. And it was stepping into the bizarre worlds of people with all these strange experiences, delusional beliefs that first got me hooked. And then I did a placement in forensic psychiatry where everybody on the ward had committed a serious offence, some of them killed people. Yeah. And it's their backstories, Mark, that really drew me in. There's always a reason that they ended up with a mental illness or with severe violence, and often it's the same reason. Uh, who are some of the worst offenders you've met? What have been the worst crimes? I think the one that really stands out to me is, is one that I talk about quite early on in my book. It's a young 18-year-old girl, uh, called her Yasmin in, in the book, it's not her real name, and she became completely psychotic almost out of the blue. She had these delusional beliefs about her young nephew, a two-year-old boy who she was babysitting, and uh, she smothered and killed him. And in her mind at the time, she didn't understand what she was doing. She, she had these delusional beliefs that he had demons inside of him and she thought she could reincarnate him. So that's a, a perfect example of a tragic story that's, that's clearly driven by mental illness. Yes, and what's happened to that woman is something physiological. She's not probably, looking at her history, a bad person. Something's gone wrong in the brain. Absolutely, and I think that's, that's quite a hard concept for some people to, to accept. 
Mm. It, she's somebody who didn't have any kind of previous violence, no criminology, mm. uh, no uh, antisocial behaviour. She didn't even really have any, pro any previous mental health issues up until a few weeks before she committed the killing. So, again, that, that's not somebody, as you say, that's evil, that's antisocial. It's just something that happened in the... Country. And also, if she hadn't been groomed online or, or indoctrinated in any way, this, this was something physiological, a bit, a bit like if you have a heart attack or something, something broke in, inside yeah, her. absolutely. And what, what would that be? Would that be a chemical imbalance or what, what, what could have happened? So in this particular case, she had schizoaffective disorder. Mm. So that is a combination of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. Absolutely, it's a chemical imbalance. Uh, psychiatrists in general can't profess to know everything about the brain, but we know that it's, it's related to dopamine levels within the brain. Yeah. So things like schizophrenia, this is not a spiritual issue? No. No. It's medical. It's medical, yeah. Right. And are there people you've encountered who are just bad people? Is there such a thing as evil? <laughs> I would say yes, there is such a thing as evil. I wouldn't use the term evil clinically. I'd use the term antisocial. So antisocial personality disorder mm. is somebody who typically lacks empathy, doesn't care about uh, the rights of other people. They don't care about obeying the law. They're impulsive. They're so Jack the Ripper was highly antisocial. He was probably antisocial and also psychopathic as well. Right, I see. And it's that lack of empathy, which is an important theme in the book, that these people commit these crimes because they don't have the usual checks and balances that you and I would go through. So I'd say that there's a, a spectrum mark. On one end mm. of the spectrum, you've got people like Yasmin, it's pure psychosis or mental illness yeah. that drives their offences. And the other end of the spectrum it is their personality disorder. So it's all those things that I was describing. And so even then, there is something wrong with them and therefore they might have murdered, but we, we need to actually understand that something again has let them down. Yeah, yeah, and, and what we do when we're rehabilitating people in these secure units is we, we dig deep into their backgrounds and try and understand the events and the traumas that they've suffered that have shaped... So if you look patterns. like a dreadful monster like Levi Belfield or, or someone like that, 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 that I guess, and I do not want to extend even an ounce of sympathy towards him, but you would probably categorise him as an unwell person rather than a bad person? Uh, well, if, if he's just antisocial and if it's not because mm. of direct symptoms of mental illness like hearing voices or mm. uh, delusions, then I would categorise him as somebody that's in control of his actions, so, yeah, a bad person. OK, interesting stuff. Have you ever feared for your own safety and have you had flashbacks to some encounters? Because you're, 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 you're in, a, in a very dark world here in your work. Yeah. Uh, I have definitely had some ha hairy moments, especially within secure units. Um, I was punched in the face my very first day, actually, on, on a secure unit. Good start. But I have to say that that is uh, exceptionally rare. So the vast majority of the time, people are on their best behaviours, especially if I'm assessing them as a one-off case in prison to write a court report. Have you been kept at a safe distance from some of the worst offenders? Yeah, so if I go to prison and if there's somebody who's just uncontrollably violent, then yeah. they'll usually be on something like a three-man unlock, which means that there's, there has to be three prison officers surrounding them at all times before they can even leave their cell. A three-man unlock? Three-man unlock, yeah. My goodness, that's quite the manoeuvre, isn't it? So you, you've had your... Jodie Jody Foster experience, Silence of the Lambs, <laughs> walking through a prison, having people snarling at you. Can somebody that's committed a murder or a heinous crime be cured? Can they be rehabilitated? In theory, yes. So if it is driven by something like schizophrenia that we were mm. talking about before, then in theory you can medicate them, take away those symptoms. If it's not, if it's something to do more with their personality, then it depends whether they want to change, whether they have insight, whether there's factors like drug and alcohol abuse, impulsivity that can be controlled through therapy. And sometimes these people who are psychotic, who don't have empathy, are good actors, aren't they? And they can be very convincing that they have changed, and you've got to look out for that too. Very manipulative people. Yeah, so not psychotic people, but psychopathic people right. are extremely cunning, manipulative, deceitful, by definition. Charming. Charming, absolutely. Yeah, and you'll be like, there's nothing wrong with this guy, let him out. He's a legend. And they, they uh, function really well in the corporate world and in media mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, I've met a few. <laughs> Me too. Uh, what are you saying? But uh, <laughs> so it's it is an extraordinary thing, and and so what have you? What, what stands out in the book? Having written the book, what stands out as as where we need to go from here in terms of understanding these crimes? I think one core truth that is quite unpalatable for a lot of people is that almost every offender, especially violent offender, has been a victim at some point in their lives. Mm. They've either experienced physical, sexual or emotional abuse, poverty, homelessness, drug abuse. It's really rare for somebody to commit regular violence and to not have that in their background.
Yes, and therefore they're just doing unto them what was, or unto others what was done to them. Yeah, in many you, cases. you repeat the pattern, you model what you know. And I guess your job is to try to break that pattern if you can. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Congratulations on the book. Uh, let's make some noise about it because I don't think it's had the publicity it deserves. So let's, uh, let's uh, remind you that this book is called In Two Minds, Stories of Murder, Justice and Recovery from a Forensic Psychiatrist. It's Dr. Shaham Das. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to meet you. And uh, we had three police officers in here just to make sure I behave myself. Um, coming up next in my Take a Ten, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, and their so-called car chase. These two are driving me around the bend. You won't want to miss my verdict in a couple of minutes. You'll need a seatbelt. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you And whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair no, of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. It's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, I'll be dealing with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex and their wildly exaggerated claims of a car chase. These two are driving me around the bend. You won't want to miss my verdict in a couple of minutes time. Do wear a seatbelt. And why have the NHS decided there are now 18 genders? I'll be putting that to tonight's newsmaker, free speech champion, Toby Young. Plus, Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages from exactly 10.30 sharp with full reaction from my top pundits, Peter Edwards, Ingrid Tarrant and Albia Mancona.
also popular free speech podcast Trigonometry, which is a hilarious listen, has been cancelled by its own bank, supposedly a very woke bank. I will speak to Trigonometry's co-creator, Constantine Kissin, in a few minutes' time. So a busy hour to come. Harry and Meghan on the way, but first the headlines with Rory Smith. Cheers, Mark. The latest from the GB Newsroom. A man who died after being attacked by a dog in Lee in Greater Manchester has been named as Jonathan Hogg. The 37-year-old was found with serious injuries yesterday evening. He was taken to hospital but died in the early hours of this morning. A 24-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of being in charge of a dangerously out-of-control dog. The brother of TV star Philip Schofield has been jailed for 12 years for child sex offences. Timothy Schofield, who was a civilian police worker, committed 11 offences between 2016 and 2019. The boy, who was abused by the 54-year-old, was praised for his remarkable bravery in coming forward. Boris Johnson's wife, Carrie, is pregnant with the couple's third child. She announced on Instagram they're expecting a sibling for Wilf and Romy in just a few weeks' time. Well, Carrie said she's been feeling pretty exhausted for much of the last eight months, but they are looking forward to welcoming the newest member of the family very soon. A man who conned victims out of more than £100 million has been jailed. TJ Fletcher founded the website iSpook, which allowed criminals to make phone calls to victims pretending they were from trusted companies. It was brought down last year in the UK's biggest fraud sting. Well, the 35-year-old has been sentenced to 13 years and four months in prison. Detective Superintendent Helen Rance says he clearly didn't care about the harm he was causing. Before it was shut down, iSpook was constantly growing with 700 new users registering every week and it was earning £80,000 per week. Fletcher was leading an extravagant lifestyle benefiting from the profits, having no care for the misery he was responsible for. The former US President Barack Obama is among 500 Americans who've, who've been banned from Russia in tit-for-tat sanctions. Well, it comes after leaders meeting at the G7 summit in Japan announced a fresh wave of fresh punishments over the war in Ukraine. The US is targeting future energy revenues and military supply chains, while Britain is banning imports of Russian diamonds, copper, aluminium and nickel. Well, meanwhile, Ukraine's president has met the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, on the sidelines of the Arab League summit in Jeddah. Vladimir Zelensky has also held meetings with the leaders of Oman, Kuwait and the UAE. Gulf countries have tried to remain neutral on the war in Ukraine, but in a speech to the summit, President Zelensky called out those who have been turning a blind eye. The Ministry of Defence has awarded contracts worth £320 million to service Royal Navy offshore patrol vessels. UK Docks Marine Services in the North East has been given an eight-year contract that's worth around £250 million and that's to support vessels including HMS Temor. It's also expected to create around 100 jobs. Well, a second contract is worth around £70 million and that has gone to BAE Systems in Portsmouth. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now, though, back to Mark. It's just gone 10 o'clock. Welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Coming up, tonight's newsmaker is free speech champion Toby Young. I'll be asking why the NHS have decided there are now 18 genders. Plus, shocking news, the globally popular podcast Trigonometry, which is a free speech brilliant chat show in which they invite people across the political spectrum onto their program. They've been cancelled by their own woke bank. I'll get reaction from the co-creator of Trigonometry, Constantine Kissin, shortly. Mark Dolan tonight is the home of the papers with tomorrow's front pages from 10.30. 
Also, our pundits will be nominating their headline heroes and back page zeros. So a busy hour to come. Big stories, big guests, and always big opinions with the papers at 10.30. But first, my take at 10. Poor old Meghan and Harry doubled up as Bonnie and Clyde on Wednesday, giving it the full Thelma and Louise as they zoomed around New York trying to shake off photographers. We're told from their spokesman, whose statements make the Kremlin sound trustworthy, that they had a near catastrophic accident. As near catastrophic as the Oprah Winfrey non-interview, perhaps, in which they poured a bucket of the brown stuff over the royal family and the institution of the monarchy. Now, that television debacle is what I would call a car crash. And how can you base a story around something that didn't happen? Nearly catastrophic. What does that mean? I'm nearly Mr. Universe. I'm nearly a billionaire. I'm nearly dating Julia Roberts, just not quite. Now, look, it can't have been fun being followed by photographers, and the taxi driver who eventually took them did say that they looked uncomfortable. And, of course, Harry has terrible memories of what happened to his dear mum. Fair enough. But in my view, this story reflects the narcissism of the couple who seek to make a global news headline out of the fact that they are famous and that someone wanted their picture. Do they not realise that with their six-part Netflix deals, book releases, podcast appearances and red carpet moments, that there might just be a smattering of interest in the couple? Might I humbly suggest that Meghan Markle, at one point a two-bit actress, marrying the son of the now King of England, might provoke a little bit of media attention? As usual, this is two people that want it both ways endlessly publicising themselves whilst supposedly craving privacy, seeking recognition from the royal family whilst endlessly attacking them and right royally slagging off the monarchy, whilst, of course, hanging on to those royal titles which are so lucrative. This couple, the king and queen of double standards, are seeking to fill column inches and make headlines for the fact that somebody tried to snap them with a camera, even though they are so beloved of a photo op themselves they'll turn up to the opening of an envelope. So when is it that the couple want to be photographed? When they've got a product to sell, perhaps? That's OK, but when they drive around one of the busiest cities in the world, New York, it's not allowed. Good luck with that. Do you not think that Tom Cruise doesn't get followed by the paparazzi? Strange that you don't hear him complaining about these sorts of things. You don't hear poor old Tom Cruise claiming that something nearly catastrophic happened to him. He gets on with it. He's the world's biggest film star. It's almost like Cruz understands that is the nature of the gig. If you play the fame game, you must follow its rules. It's the same reason why I get a few glances when I'm down at my local Iceland on the Holloway Road. Not going to lie, those glances are often admiring. The audience for Mark Dolan tonight is growing by the day, and I'm normally beating Sky News around now. Anyone in the public eye must accept public attention and having their photograph taken even when it's not wildly convenient. I will say something that's impressive about this couple, though. Managing to have a car chase in congested New York, where there are traffic lights every 11 seconds and where the tailbacks are notorious. I can only imagine their car was flying above the other cars in the way that pigs might fly. I'm sorry, but I'm not buying their story. In my view, this reflects the narcissism of this couple. They think that they're Lewis Hamilton. Honestly, was there really a high-speed chase? I don't think so. I'm not having it. Harry and Meghan might think they are the fast and the furious, but this story is an old banger. With their claims of a high-octane car chase, these two, not for the first time, are pulling a fast one. Your reaction to you by their story, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Let's hear from my pundits tonight. I'm delighted uh, to welcome the wonderful, brilliant journalist, of course, former editor of Labourist Peter Edwards, broadcaster and TV presenter Ingrid Tarrant, and financial analyst and GB News star Albie Amancona. 
Ingrid, your reaction to this car chase? <laughs> It is just absolutely completely farcical. Well, let me just go through this. The spokesman, well, you know that that's Omid Scobie, so he's going to be completely whatever... Scobie he, Doby do. <laughs> ..whatever he's told to say, he will say it. Um, I gather also that um, Meghan's mother was asleep in the back of the car, so I don't know how uncomfortable uh, they really, really were, and I don't know if that's true or not. Um, these pedestrians that apparently were leaping out of the way, why haven't we had one of the pedestrians come through saying that they've been completely traumatised or they stump their toe on a, a garbage bin, sort of like um, in the process and everything. And they had all the bodyguards, don't forget, going in their cars behind them and everything. And I just love the taxi driver. I just think he's so lovely that sort of suddenly they're in the back and then it's back to the police station, back and forth, back and forth. They have created the frenzy, which they love. And being photographed is part of the course. They know that and everything. But you know what I think it is? Because she wants control over everything. Mm. And because she can't control the photographs that were being taken, but at the same time, she's courting that whole, that whole frenzy anyway. It's truly pathetic. I can't stand it. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to see a picture of her face anymore, actually. Peter Edwards, you're a top journalist. How can something that didn't happen become a global news story? Well, first, yeah, I mean, I've never been called a top journalist before, but let's let's skip over that. <laughs> you're, you're expert at poking fun at Harry and Meghan, and I would say some of their choices in the last couple of years, particularly constantly battering the royal family, have been very poor choices. But, and I don't know if you're a, a driver, Mark, but for any, uh, anyone who's a motorist, a near miss can be frightening. If you have, say, somewhere like London on the M25, a near miss at high speed can be frightening. You don't actually have to be hit in order to feel a bit shaken up by it. Uh, of course, the New York police poured quite a bit of cold water over it in the statement follow it, following it, saying, you know, there were no arrests, no injuries, no collisions, and so on and so on. But you rightly alluded, Mark, to the, the terrible fact of history that underlines this whole story, which is um, the death of Princess Diana in 1997 in a car after being chased by photographers. So you could understand why um, Harry and his family um, would feel very emotional after something, even if there's something that happened in New York this week was perhaps at the lower end of things. Although I wonder, Albi Amancona, whether making such a drama out of a crisis would be quite upsetting and disturbing to Prince William, given the fact that there was no car crash. Perhaps it was wrong to invoke echoes of Diana in Paris. I think I would agree with you there, Mark. I don't doubt that they were very scared and perhaps this was a a two-hour car chase, as they mentioned, although they seem to have poured cold water on that. I think what I wonder is why did they make this huge global announcement that this had happened and not just deal with it privately and just say to their friends and family, I was in a really scary situation, it was really scary, can you comfort me, can I have a hug? I think that's what most normal people would do. They wouldn't issue a formal written statement and issue it to the world's media and create a frenzy about it. Yeah, too right. Your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Do you want to lend your support to Harry and Meghan and their almost catastrophic car crash? Uh, next up, we're going to talk about the car crash that is the NHS, who now believe there are 18 genders. We'll discuss that, plus why one of the world's most popular podcasts has just been cancelled by its own bank. All of that's next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I'm a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the program sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely right. unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. Uh, now, this is pretty shocking news, uh, let me tell you. The very popular podcast Trigonometry, which has welcomed guests from across the political spectrum, but which dares to platform those who are sometimes critical of wokeism or gender ideology, has had its bank account from Tide Bank cancelled. The co-founder of Trigonometry is Constantine Kissin, who's the author of the best-selling An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, and he joins me now. Hi, Constantine. Mark, Constantine, hello, when did you, you find out that your account had been cancelled by this bank? Uh, we got a message about a week ago, and since that moment, we've been going back and forth with Tide Bank, uh, trying to find out what the reason for them cancelling our bank account was. Uh, they refused to give us an explanation, which made us very suspicious. We know, as you do, uh, for example, that there are other people in this country, uh, fairly mainstream people, actually, who've been unable to get a bank account for their a political party and so on um and so because of that we knew that that is a possible it's a possibility that this is politically motivated we still haven't had an answer uh five days later eventually after many questions they simply told us they cannot provide any further information and shut down the conversation and because of that today we put an, uh, a statement out on social media which went viral we had everyone from the free speech union to jordan peterson to all sorts of friends and colleagues uh, share this and uh, within a few hours, Tide suddenly could provide further information. And uh, in fact, they just said that they're investigating this as a matter of the highest priority. So we'll wait and see to find out uh, what the reason for this is. Uh, and we'll take it from there. Do you have a suspicion that this is politically motivated, that you've welcomed I mean, your programme is absolutely brilliant and you listen to speakers from across the political spectrum, but you've interviewed the likes of Nigel Farage from GB News. Could that be your great crime? Uh, maybe. We've also interviewed Lord Andrew Adonis, the arch Remainer. We do try to speak to people from all sides, as you say. I hope that's not the case. I hope this has been a mistake of some kind. But as I said, we do have... Uh, previous cases and so that is obviously something we have thought about look they, they they messed with the wrong people in this instance we've already had several offers from competitor banks uh to open an account we've already taken all our money out of tide and uh, we'll be finding out what's going on and frankly you know mark this wasn't really ever about us we were always going to be okay as you said we, we're pretty big now and we, we can weather the storm what our concerns me is the contempt with it with which they treated us when they told us they were closing our bank account and if we we were not able to raise uh, these sort of concerns on social media and get traction uh, and threaten legal action, uh, then perhaps we, we, would, we would be in a position where we couldn't get another bank account and, and they would be able to treat uh, other customers with this sort of contempt, which is one of the reasons we're watching very carefully what they say and do. And if we're not happy about it, we will join forces with others, we will sue them, and uh, we're going to take this all away because it's completely unacceptable.
This disproves the idea that cancel culture is a myth, and it's a deep, deeply uh, chilling development, isn't it? We, we saw Us For Them, which is essentially a campaign group aimed at protecting the interests and rights of children. Uh, they lost their funding model through PayPal. The Free Speech Union were cancelled by PayPal. You couldn't make it up. This is beyond satire. That's why it has to be opposed right at the beginning, I think. And so, uh, as I say, we will look. Uh, I don't have any evidence at the moment that this is mm. politically motivated. I also don't have any evidence that it's not because of the complete disregard for honesty and, and, and open communication that Tide have shown in this instance. So we will wait and see and we will find out. But you're right, Mark, this has happened before. And so what that means to me is we really have to make sure that uh, we push back on every instance where something like this happens. We have to be really vigilant because what's next? Well, are we going to cut off electricity from people that we disagree with if that is what's happened here? Uh, this is completely unacceptable in a free society. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a big concern. You're right. And you mentioned the Free Speech Union. The Reclaim Party can't get a bank account. Uh, there, there are all sorts of these uh, situations going on. And uh, as I say, completely unacceptable. Indeed. So stay with us for a moment, if you can, Constantine, because with us now is free speech champion, the co-founder of the Daily Skeptic online newspaper and the founder of the Free Speech Union, Toby Young. Uh, Toby, your reaction to this story, worth stressing as what Constantine has said there, that we cannot definitively prove that this is somehow a judgment on what trigonometry do, but it's a worrying development either way. Yeah, it's extremely concerning. Um, uh, we're seeing, I think, increasingly um, channels like trigonometry uh, being uh, demonetized, no platformed by financial services companies, not because they've done anything unlawful, unlawful, but because um, the someone, some executives uh, at the banking company, the payment processing company, disapprove of the views being expressed uh, by that organization. And, you know, they shouldn't have any business uh, censoring the views of people, even if they disapprove of those views. They shouldn't be intervening in debates and discussions in the public square in this way and trying to promote a particular ideological agenda, whether it's a left-wing agenda or a right-wing agenda. And um, as Constantine says, I mean, it, it happened to the Free Speech Union. It happened to me personally. It happened to the Daily Skeptic last year. We kicked up an enormous fuss just as Constantine is doing now. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and in the end, all our accounts were reinstated. But it wasn't just us. There were plenty of people who've had their accounts removed for purely political reasons, not because they've done anything illegal, but just because the company seemed to disapprove of certain things they're saying. So law or fiction, the UK Medical Freedom Alliance, um, a company called, an organization called Left Lockdown Skeptics was uh, debanked by um, PayPal. What we're seeing, Mark, is the uh, embryonic form of the Chinese social credit system beginning to emerge in the West. And we have to draw a line in the, in the sand. We have to make it absolutely clear that we won't tolerate this interference in our democracy by these companies that often aren't even based here. They're based in California. They're based somewhere overseas. What right do they have to uh, 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 kick people off uh, their platforms to exclude them from the public square just because they happen to disapprove of their perfectly lawful views or the lawful views of people they have on their shows. It's completely unacceptable. We have to draw a line in the sand and say, no, we're not going to stand for this. Constantine, this is not a confected culture war. Uh, this is not a conspiracy theory, is it? We saw the Canadian government freeze the bank accounts of truckers who objected to vaccine mandates during the pandemic. Uh, we did indeed, and this is why we are suspicious. As I, I got to keep repeating this because I, I want to be fair. We don't know if this is politically motivated, uh, but the reason we are all concerned is, as Toby mentioned, there have been plenty of cases in this country and in others of this happening. So when it happens to a podcast, look, you know, our mission at Trigonometry is to have honest conversations with fascinating people about difficult subjects, and so mm -hmm. I understand that. There is a sensitivity about the conversations that we have, but I don't think that makes us inel ineligible for a bank account. I, I, as Toby says, I don't think people who commit no crimes should ever fear that 
situation occurring with them. Uh, and in our case, we are determined to make sure that this hasn't happened in this case, and we're determined to make sure that Tide suffer the consequences of their behavior, even if this isn't politically motivated. I mean, this is not acceptable. You can't shut down people's bank account and refuse to give them an explanation. That 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 isn't right. And so we're going to keep pursuing this. We're going to wait and see very carefully what Tide come back with after their high priority investigation, which they initially refused to do. And if we're not happy about it, all options are on the table because we're looking out for other people who may not have the cloud that we have uh, to go after them and make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Well, on your podcast, you interview figures on the left and the right. It's highly entertaining. Yourself and Francis Foster co-created Trigonometry. It's a global phenomenon. I'd recommend all of my viewers and listeners give it a try if they haven't already and support it in every way they can. Ditto for the Free Speech Union and the Daily Skeptic online newspaper, both co-founded by Toby Young. Mark, may Francis I just in jump Toby? in and actually, before you go, just to say that actually it. the Free Speech Union is so important because when things like this happen, first thing I did is had a chat with Toby and I said, look, this is what's going on. And having the backing of the Free Speech Union meant that we were very comfortable in pursuing this quite aggressively. So uh, follow trigonometry, of course, but also make sure you, you support the Free Speech Union because it will protect not only us, but a lot of people like us. Uh, very important. So thank you both. In pushing back on these dark, censorious voices, we wish you both well. My thanks to Constantin Kissin and Toby Young. Coming up next, the papers with full pundit reactions, some cracking headlines. See you in two. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now, and I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel, and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. It's 10.30 and it's time for this.
Okay, let's have a look at the papers hot off the press. We start with the mail and they lead with this. Energy bills to fall £450 as cap is slashed. Good news, folks, at last on a Friday. Households will soon see energy bills fall by almost £500 in a fresh sign that the worst of the cost of living squeeze is nearing an end. Typical annual charges are expected to fall from £2,500 to £2,000 when the summer price cap is revealed next week. Wholesale gas prices, which soared after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, are continuing to drop in a major blow to Vladimir Putin's objective of weaponizing energy supplies. And next week, official figures are set to show inflation will be below 10% for the first time since last summer. Uh, also, now it'll be three babies in three years for Boris and Carrie. Well, he's been busy since he left number 10, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Next up, we've got the Times newspaper. AI is a clear and present danger to education. A coalition of leaders of some of the country's top schools have warned of the very real and present hazards and dangers presented by this amazingly powerful software. The Daily Telegraph now, US talking itself into economic decline. Forgive me, correction, the UK. The UK, uh, could be both, UK talking itself into economic decline. Britain is at risk of looking so negatively at itself with a growing sense of insidious and corrosive negativity. This, according to Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, writing for The Telegraph, he says that critics on the left and right who portray the country as on the slide risk making that a self-fulfilling prophecy. He made the intervention after Tories voiced concerns at a national conservatism conference this week about the state of Britain, whilst Nigel Farage of this parish said Brexit had failed and Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, vowed to rework the EU deal. Um, so look, uh, we'll get to uh, more of those economic stories in a moment. Childline website promotes trans treatment. Childline has been accused of failing children after teenagers who believed they were trans were told via its website to seek potentially dangerous treatments behind their parents' back, including uh, breast binding and hormone blockers without parental knowledge. You can't call them breasts, it's chest. It is chest. Be chest Correct. Better get that right or I'll be cancelled. Yeah, yeah, well yeah. said, Ingrid Tarrant. Uh, next up, we've got the Daily Express. Energy bills to tumble. It's a hat trick. Boris and Carrie's pregnancy joy. Daily Mirror. Give up your sick secrets, Rose. Rose West is under pressure to tell all about the horrific crimes that she and twisted husband Fred committed. The I Weekend UK inflation set to fall sharply next week with lower energy bills to follow. And last but not least for now, the Daily Star, cost of living crisis hits Prime Minister. Rishi's down to his last half a billion. Spare a thought for poor Rishi Sunak, who has dropped down the rich list and now has just £529 million left in the bank. OK, well, we'll get to some of the other papers very shortly, but let's get reaction now from my fantastic pundits tonight. The former editor of Labour List, political commentator Peter Edwards. Broadcaster and TV host Ingrid Tarrant and GB News star, presenter of The Saturday Five, which happens tomorrow evening at eight o'clock. It's Albi Amancona. And Peter, great news. Energy bills to fall. The news that we needed. We've been waiting for a long time. Well, I was interested in this. Uh, yeah, I used to be a financial journalist. Um, I think it's interesting. This story, energy and inflation, is across most of the papers tomorrow one way or the other. But remember, the independent office budget responsibility said that inflation was going to come down anyway, regardless mm. of government action. Richie Sunak named it as one of his five priorities. Fair enough. But it was going to come down anyway. And there's a sting in the tail that energy prices are not going to revert to their previous level. Mm. They're not going to go back to the level of 2015, 2018. No, indeed. So, although surely, by standing up to the unions and refusing their inflation-busting demands, Rishi Sunak has kept downward pressure on inflation. Uh, I don't really think that's fair at all. That, you know, what, what are the drivers of inflation? Um, food prices. Wage rises. Food prices, because we don't... Money grow... printing. Well, that's a Bank of England policy rather than a government policy. But, you know, Theresa May um, closed off some of our gas reserves. We don't produce enough of our energy. That's a generation they're making. We don't grow enough of, of our food. Um, we've got very expensive public transport, yet that is part-owned by foreign governments. Um, 
even though there's no nationalisation of the British Rail Network. So the economy is designed in the wrong way, and I don't want to make everything too party political. Lots of these things have happened <laughs> on the top of the But this is good. But, 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 Peter, come on, can't we just agree that it's good that inflation's coming down, energy prices are coming down, the Prime Minister's on his way to meeting one of his five pledges? That's a good thing. I don't believe it, well, though. Of course, yeah, we, we, we all want lower inflation, but is, is that We're happening... We're getting lower inflation. Well, well, is that well, happening Peter... be, because of government action or despite government inaction? P Peter is, is not giving Rishi Sunak credit for standing up to the unions whose wage demands will cause inflation to explode. Mm. Well, I mean, we had wage demands coming from some of the unions. I think the nurses, the RCN, wanted... 19% pay rise. I think they want a double-digit pay rise Even now. the Labour Party said they wouldn't I've, get that. I've not had a double-digit pay rise. Have I, has anyone on this panel Even though you're worth the money. double-digit pay rise? Mm -hmm. No. So why is it that anyone should be getting a double-digit pay rise? Well, they're not in playing for our cars now. In fact, it's gone down. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is good news. And, and actually, this ties in with the theme but of I don't an article... It. Can I just say go, something? Go, go being a it. cynic here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because... Um, uh, it, it, it's just. I think it's. The, it's. There's a, a horrible hidden little message here. Um, it's all kind of because of the energy bills and, and so on, mm. because that's a huge factor, a driving factor in this, because that's what sort of like shot it through the roof. There's two things here that I'll say. Uh, Jeremy Hunt was all for putting up taxes, taxes, taxes to keep a cap on it, and they failed to meet their target to keep it down and everything. So. Um, They've just lost the by-elections very, very badly. So this, I think, is their thing. Well, look how well we're suddenly doing. So that's going to be the new thing planting in, in people's minds. Mm -hmm. I don't buy it. The other thing as well, which I really, really don't um, like at all, it, it sniffs to me, is um, household bills fall by 500%, yeah, or 450 is, is slashed. Pounds, pounds, pounds. The pounds, I mean, pounds. <laughs> Thank you. But here in the Telegraph, they go one step further. As Putin's energy war fails. Yes. Energy war fails. This is a dig at the whole Russian thing. Putin, that wall, the war and everything. So that, again, is putting another little seed in our minds that it's all his fault in the very first place. But actually, do you know what? We're getting really self-sufficient now. Mm. I just... I don't like what the, the reading between the lines says. And I don't trust yeah. it. Yeah. And I you, don't you, trust you Jeremy feel Hunt. There's more, more uh, play in the background. Yeah, uh, what do. about this, this piece that Hunt has written for The Telegraph saying that we've got to snap out of this negativity? Because he I wonder... Us there. He was Mr Doom and Gloom. He was. But he inherited an economic nightmare, didn't he? I mean, the bottom line is that the international bond markets would no longer lend to the British people mm. competitively. Well, my, my Borrowing was one. out of control. That, that's the real irony. I thought um, Jeremy Hunt has a blimmin' cheek saying this, having served as a cabinet minister in the coalition, because the actual run on the pound that we had under Liz Truss in the last year was a nightmarish fantasy made up by George Osborne about the Labour government in 2010, which mm. didn't happen and was never going to happen. And then when it did finally happen, it happened under a Tory government. Jeremy Hunt's got a cheek saying this. It's outrageous talking about... Uh, bringing down the economy through doom and gloom, when he's been in the government for about 10 of the last 12 years. Uh, what do you think? Do you think Hunt is hypocritical here to say that we've got to be less negative about the country? No, I think, I think Jeremy Hunt is absolutely right. We've got to be less negative about the economy. Lots of people like to hate on Jeremy Hunt. I don't know why. Liz Truss actually said something very similar last summer. Lots of Liz Truss supporters seem to hate Jeremy Hunt, but they're both actually saying the same thing. We can talk ourselves into a recession. And I do think the United Kingdom has a bright future ahead of it. Yes, we've got some big changes to make in the country in terms of our tax system, in terms of regulation, but I don't like all of this doom and gloom. Unfortunately, Albie, there is a, an entire generation of politicians and media commentators who want Britain to fail because of Brexit. I don't know that that is fair. I think that generation of media commentators are disappointed with the result of Brexit and would rather the country but went But when, when we get bad direction. economic news, they always go, told you so, it's Brexit, we need to go back in. But do you not think that if Remain had won the referendum, Brexiteers would be saying the same thing? I just think mm -hmm. it's two opposing sides. I don't think it's necessarily helpful to say Remainers want the country to do badly. Everyone, I think, in Britain, most people in Britain want the country to do well. I just think we've got to accept the result of Brexit and do the best with what we have. Do you think we ever will? Will the Brexit wars ever end? It's interesting that you say this because it kind of connects to one of these other stories that you were that you mentioned about Keir Starmer allegedly dragging us back into the European yep. Union. And I do actually think the Brexit debate could be something which bubbles up again. Only because if you look at polling, and especially polling in the youngest two age cohorts, say between 
uh, people born between 1984 and 2004, you actually see that around 67% of that group of people, I'm in that cohort, mm. think that Brexit was a bad idea. If you broaden it out to the broader population, it's actually 58% of people who think it's a bad idea because of how it's been handled since Brexit. So I do think that we could be entering a period where Brexit's up, up for debate again. Really? So you oh. would, would you countenance the idea of, of another referendum at some point? I don't know could about... Could it be like Scotland, where you do it every five years? I don't know about another referendum, but I would not be surprised if there are more voices coming from both parties, by the way, about closer European alignment. OK, uh, interesting stuff. Do you, do you think that Labour will bring us closer to Europe? I think they'll bring us closer relationship-wise, but I think Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves know that they will be toast, and I do mean toast politically, um, if they have any hints about running a second referendum. Remember, they've already ruled out no to going back into the customs mm. union, no to the single market, and no to freedom of movement. So that's wrapping up integration and immigration, which are seen um, as the main driver of the Brexit vote. So there is zero chance of going back in under a Labour government, but on the other hand, you know, how often do we have referendums like this? I'm 41. There could easily be another one in my lifetime. I don't think there's an appetite for it. But, you know, you're right there. I mean, if we can trust Starmer, he said, he, uh, of course, he was a Remainer and everything, but he said there's no, well, generally speaking, there is no appetite uh, for another referendum. And he's saying you can't look over your shoulder, let's just kind of get on with it and make Brexit work. And so I, I hope that he is true to his, his word in that sort of like respect. And just to sort of like, um, he wants to kind of uh, restore trust and build up be better trade relationships and everything. That's not a bad thing. That really isn't a bad thing. But we mustn't lose what we have, because we, we can be self-sufficient. We've become so reliant. Definitely. Well, I think you've got to give Brexit a chance. I think we need a decade before it can be judged, and I believe it will be a success. And I say that as a Remainer, but yeah. I think there are many reasons why it's panning out pretty well. But, look, that's just my view. What's yours, Mark, at gbnews.uk? Uh, coming up, we've got more front pages. We've got The Mirror and The Guardian to come. Big news for Boris Johnson. He's going to be a father again in a few weeks' time, so we'll discuss that. Plus, the NHS now thinks that there are 18 genders. These are the people responsible for your health. All of that is next. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you in whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Look, I could read a million of your brilliant emails, but I want to read this from Sally and John because it's absolutely devastating. And it's about the government, it's about the economy, and it's about their business. Hi, Mark. Love your programme and GB News, say Sally and John. We run a small, successful pub. I voted Conservative for most of my life, voted Labour in 97, but that's history. I cannot see myself voting Tory at the next election. As we're struggling, we work extremely hard as a result of which our quarterly VAT bill was over £25,000. We've had to borrow eight grand to supplement that payment and to be able to pay our PAYE bill on Monday. I don't believe in not paying our employees or suppliers, which is why we've borrowed the money. We've been in this same business for 34 years now. I've never been in such a bad position. The cost of everything, especially the taxes, are killing us. We're running at a loss and we're the busiest we've ever been. My husband and I have tonight joined the Reform Party in the hope that something will change. Well, Sally and John, thank you so much for telling me about your situation. You clearly run an amazing pub. You've obviously got great staff, great customers. And I'm so sorry to hear that although you are busy, you're now running at a loss. Welcome to Broken Britain. Um, thanks, Sally and John. Let's get to a couple more papers. The Guardian, they lead with the following. Patients paying £550 an hour for private GPs. And Harrison Ford bids a tearful farewell to Indiana Jones. And the Daily Mirror, serial killer exclusive. Give up your sick secrets, Rose. Evil Fred West urged... See, evil Fred West. Evil Rose West urged to come clean on her murders and any other victims. I want to get to another story in the papers. And NHS chiefs are under fire for listing 18 gender options on a patient form. That's right, 18, including Two-Spirit. Don't know what that is, but apparently that's used by indigenous communities, Two-Spirit. The paperwork also includes an other option for those not covered by the extensive list. So, shall we go through the list and find out all the different genders that the NHS thinks you've got. Mm. Male, that's nice. Female, Ooh, Can I write school. this down? <laughs> yeah, I think you're female, but I might have to check, Ingrid. Non-binary, passing, third gender, transgender, transgender man, transgender woman, two-spirit, agender, bigender, cisgender, gender expression, gender fluid, gender queer, gender variant, prefer not to say, and other. The What's cisgender? CIS gender? That's yeah. apparently what you are. Am I? Yes. Because a cisgender woman is a biological female. So you're not just Why a woman can't I just anymore. Be a woman? Well, oh. because that would make you a bigot if you called yourself a woman. You've got to be a cis woman. Ooh. Yes. And I'm a cis man. Or a bit oh. of a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, uh, this is not a great use of the NHS resources, is it? I think it's good to talk about different groups with care and sensitivity. Of course, the job of the NHS is saving lives mm. and um, preventing harm. But if it's a little bit of time and energy on trying to ensure dignity for people, especially when they're sick. You know, if you're a transgender cancer patient, you probably um, want to be treated with respect and care. I mean, this, this is, is a this little is part of that. Accommodating bonkers ideology, the bottom line is the patient is either a biological male or a biological female. After all, if a male comes into A&E, they're not going to be giving birth, are they? No, me men can't give birth. But, but they are asked if they're pregnant. What? I don't Before they administer any me uh, medication. I don't think it's necessary to ask a man if they're pregnant because there are certain facts in life we talked about earlier. But bear in mind, people seeing the NHS are sick people. So, again, if, if you're a cancer patient but you're also perhaps in some emotional distress over your mm. gender identity, there's nothing wrong with um, public sector professionals showing a bit of um, care in their language. 
I mean, perhaps I'll be the solution would be for four options, which is male, female, transgender woman, transgender man. But 18 is a bit OTT, isn't it? I think 18 seems a bit OTT. I think most people nowadays, you know, understand there are trans men and trans women and men and women. They might just about get their heads around non-binary as well. But the rest of it seems a bit indulgent. Mm. You know, I think even five is probably too much for some people. But I think most people probably generally understand those principles. 18, I think, is, is going a bit cuckoo. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's time now for my pundits to nominate their headline heroes and back page zeros. So, Peter Edwards, who's caught your eye today? Um, well, I wanted to flag up the superhuman efforts of Kevin Sinfield, the rugby league player, yeah. um, running marathon after marathon for his uh, friend suffering from, I think, motor neurone disease uh, in aid of the charity. And I know nothing at all about rugby league, but this is a story that's crossed sports and all newspapers and all media because it is inspiring above and beyond the, the physical effort as well. Uh, absolutely. What a great nomination for headline hero. Ingrid, who are you a fan of today? Well, no, oh, yours is brilliant. I love yours. Um, it's Suella Braverman because I think she is just pushing, pushing, pushing for what she believes, and that is actually take control of the borders, keep the numbers down. She's not doing a very good job. She's not doing... No, <laughs> but she's trying. At least she's, she's trying. She's not trying hard enough. She's a lone no, voice in the cabinet, she, she is. She's trying to be Prime Minister, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, do you know, I think really, genuinely, her heart is in it. I didn't... I don't think Priti Patel's heart was completely in it. It was She was making the right noises because that's what everybody wanted to hear. But I really think she's tried so hard. She tried to do the Randa thing. She's used her legal um, uh, knowledge and expertise to, to make it legal to be able to do that and not illegal. I mean, the, the plane was like left on the tarmac at the very last minute. I think she's really, really trying and she's not getting the support of um, the, the cabinet, the backbenchers. She's not getting support really of the public because we, we haven't been able to show the people that do support her, come on, girl, you can do it. We're behind you on this. So, I think, bravo. Yeah, I mean, the likes of Braverman are jockeying for position, aren't they? Almost anticipating that the Tories will lose the next election. I think that would be very unwise. I would still put my money on Rishi Sunak for the next election. I believe in him as a Conservative Party. I think he's the man for the job. I would say to Suella Braverman, who was criticising the government's line on migration, she's either proving that she's not a very influential Home Secretary or she's not very good at her job, but she just can't get anything done. So I think constantly attacking the government or be being seen to attack the government on this migrant line mm. just shows her own shortcoming. Your headline hero. So my headline hero are Mr and Mrs Johnson, so Boris and Carrie Johnson, who are, of course, single-handedly solving Britain's fertility crisis. <laughs> they really are. You know, are. I think Boris is now going to be on, what, his 8th, 9th, 11th, no, I, I think... 350th child. <laughs> who knows? But Miriam Cates and a lot of Conservatives at the National Conservatism Conference <laughs> were talking about our plummeting fertility rates being a huge issue for the country. Boris is coming to save oh, the day. Thank God. you, Boris. Boris Jeans. Oh, I'm not <laughs> he's, sure He's really that. put his back into it, hasn't he? Making <laughs> lots of future prime ministers. Um, what did you think about that speech from Miriam Cates earlier in the week when she said that we need more homegrown children? Um, because some on the left, in particular, I was reading The Guardian today, that they thought that was a bit racist, that we shouldn't restock the country from abroad. Do you think, do you think the idea that we want British families to reproduce is somehow a racist thing? <laughs> do you know, actually, Mark, it's funny you say that, because a couple of weeks ago I was doing a radio interview on another station and I mentioned that Sheila we Fogarty. needed... Sheila Fogarty, exactly. And you um, said and we I need said families we need to have more, more children. We need more pronatal policies, we need more British you families did. to have children. Um, and she looked, you know, lovely Great woman. Asked, asked whether or not she thought that was... Whether or not I thought that was a racist policy. And I had to say to Sheila, Sheila, you can't see me, but I'm black. <laughs> and I don't think it's racist. <laughs> I think British families should have more children. That includes black families, white families, Asian families. All British families should have more children. It's a wonderful thing. Yes, brilliant stuff. Well, well done to you. Props for what was a great interview with, with the excellent Sheila Fogarty. Uh, let's crack on now with our back page baddies. Peter, briefly, if you can. Well, energy crisis has filled the pages, so I was going to go for a national grid, mm. um, privatised uh, supplier of lo lots of infrastructure, profits of £4.5 billion. I don't want to blame everything on the government, but I think we need to change the law, allow a national grid to give some money back to us.
Uh, Ingrid, why is your back page baddie the Defence Secretary? Um, it comes in light, I suppose, of the um, Arabian summit, Zelensky sort of going f there and now he's about to go on to Japan and everything. And it just all brings Ben Wallace to my mind because he went out with the, the begging bowl in, the, in 1919 asking for, for money and getting a, a, the biggest increase in expenditure um, in 30 years, I think even actually since World War II. And um, and it was meant for us. And actually, but there is a small print thing here. It was um, it was to invest in next generation. This was his um, his message um, to to Boris at the time that why he wanted so much money. It was to invest in next generation military capability. Yeah, absolutely. Defending our people from new and evolving threats. But then there's okay. another thing, and provoking, um, uh, uh, protecting world, the world's most vulnerable. So he's got the money, and it's where's bingo, it all going? Bingo, bingo, follow Ukraine. the cash. Uh, brilliant stuff. And Albies, Meghan and Harry couldn't agree more. Penny says, on um, regards Harry and Meghan, catastrophic car chase, one word, balderdash. Thanks to your company, I'm back tomorrow at nine. Headliners is next. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, uh, suffering on a scale uh, completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel.